have all of the board members with us um, now, so we will uh, go ahead and um, reopen the continued public hearings for the uh, 2020 special town meeting, the Warren Articles, in front of us tonight. Uh, this open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the Arlington Redevelopment Board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So we will take a roll call of the Arlington Redevelopment Board members uh, before I move into some specific instructions about tonight's public hearing. So as I call your name, please uh, announce that you are here. Kin Lau. Present. David Watson. Present. Eugene Benson. Present. Katie Levine Einstein. Present. And I'm Rachel Zemberry. Uh, we have two staff members joining us this evening from the uh, Department of Planning. Uh, Jenny Raitt. Here. And also there's another staff person oh, as well. Fantastic. Erin Zwerko. Here. And who else do we have joining us this evening? I'm sorry, I can't see all the names here. Kelly Linema. Wonderful. Here. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So the subject of tonight's um, uh, public hearing are the Warren articles for the 2020 special town meeting. Tonight is the second night of hearings, uh, the first being last Thursday evening and the third being on Wednesday the 28th uh, for a total of six warrant articles. Consistent with the past, the Arlington Re Redevelopment Board will be hearing from the applicants and the public wishing to speak on each of these articles as scheduled. The board will pose any questions to the, ask to the applicants, but will reserve discussion and voting on each article on recommended, act, on recommended action until the last night of the hearings, which is Wednesday the 28th. So a few uh, items of note for anyone wishing to speak at the uh, Zoning Warrant Article public hearings tonight. The subject matter of the hearings were posted on the agenda. Any pe person wishing to address the redevelopment board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall signify their desire to speak by raising their hand when the chair announces consideration of each item. To raise your hand and zoom on your computer, go to the participant section and select raise hand or on your phone, press star six to unmute yourself. After being recognized to speak by the chair, such persons will preface their comments by giving their first and last name and their street address. Anyone wishing to address the board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall limit their remarks to three minutes and may be allowed to speak more than once at the discretion of the chair. To do so, please raise your hand again using the participant section of Zoom. The board may receive any oral or written evidence, but such evidence is restricted to the subject matter of the agenda item. Immaterial or unduly repetitious evidence may be excluded. People present at the public hearing are requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or action taken at the hearing. Hearing participants shall refrain from interrupting other speakers and conduct themselves in a civil courteous manner. Speakers should address questions through the chair and speakers should not attempt to engage in debate or dialogue with the redevelopment board members or other hearing participants. Questions may or may not be answered during the public hearing. And with that, we will move to the first article on our agenda, which is Article 19. First, I'd like to make sure that the 
that Barbara Thornton is on the call. She is fantastic. Apologies, I have a large number of participants to scroll through, so I appreciate you bearing with me. So the first article uh, is a zoning bylaw amendment for accessory dwelling units. And first I will turn this over to um, Jennifer Rate with the uh, planning department. Thank you, Rachel. It's Jennifer Raid. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the town. And we have a memo that's been posted and submitted regarding both of the articles being heard this evening. The first of them is the Accessory Dwelling Unit Bylaw proposal, which is inserted at the request of Barbara Thornton and other um, registered voters. And so what we're going to hear about is a warrant article that is not as similar <laughs> as the one that we discussed last uh, 2019 annual town meeting. This one differs pretty significantly from that uh, zoning amendment in a couple of different ways, uh, which I've enumerated in my memo. The first of them is that uh, our proposal had been limited to R0 and R1 zoning districts. This proposal is for all residential zoning districts. The second big difference is that our proposal was special permit. This proposal is for by right. Um, and the applicant, uh, the applicant, the, the uh, proponent will describe the reasons for those changes and how that relates substantially to the proposal that has been submitted to us and uh, why um, they believe that it's important to allow accessory dwelling units um, in a variety of residential districts, not just limited to those two that were discussed at the last uh, town meeting in 2019. Um, and so I, I won't run through every single reason why to allow accessory dwelling units, um, but I will say that it is a common practice to allow accessory dwelling units throughout the Metro Boston area and in many other states uh, and all different types of jurisdictions allow accessory dwelling units of different kinds in different places, in the primary house, um, in accessory buildings, um, and there can be a lot of different options, different sizes and scales, uh, limited to certain um, uh, numbers of people and ideally not limited at all um, because it's meant to be a way in which uh, jurisdictions create more opportunities for housing as well as create an opportunity for a property owner um, who may have different needs. For example, they ha may have a need for generating additional income, they may have a need for additional caretakers, um, and they may have other changing household uh, generational issues uh, that need to be addressed and that are best accommodated with this type of accessory unit. Um, there's lots of different ways in which these are uh, created in zoning bylaws throughout this particular region. Um, the bylaw that is presented this evening uh, looks similar to some of those other uh, zoning bylaws. In terms of what we think would be the best uh, approach, we have a couple of recommendations of how this could be um, amended, in, including uh, the, the originally proposed definition, which embedded uh, basically dimensional requirements and, and things that we've talked about in prior uh, meetings and as well as public hearings, um, which is to take that information and put it into a different section of the bylaw. Um, we've also talked about how this relates to the housing production plan, which is, uh, it is a way of encouraging uh, and creating benefits to property owners by allowing this additional space in their homes. Um, and as I've already noted to different, uh, serving different needs. So um, I think that with that, that is all I'm going to talk about in terms of accessory dwelling units. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Barbara is here and she can speak to her article more specifically. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jenny. Barbara, we'll turn the floor over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this evening and I'm going to uh, read as quickly as I can to, to tell you why I am here. My name is Barbara Thornton. My address is 223 Park Avenue in Arlington. I am a town meeting member in Precinct 16. Article 19 proposes to allow accessory dwelling units as of right in each of the residential districts in Arlington, 
in order to create more ho affordable housing opportunities. Why is this zoning legislation important? I'm going to go through five categories, uh, and this is the first one. Arlington is losing the diversity it once had. It has become increasingly difficult for residents who have grown up and grown old in the town to remain here. This will only become more difficult if the effects of tax increases to support the new schools, including the high school, roll into the tax bills for lower income residents and senior citizens on a fixed income. For young adults raised in Arlington, the price of a home to buy or to rent is also increasingly out of reach. So who benefits from ADUs? Families who need flexibility as their needs change over time. Older adults who need support and or income to stay in their own homes. Households with disabled persons. Residents who value a diversity of housing choices in the town. People needing a non-subsidized form of housing that is generally less costly and more affordable than similar units in multifamily dwellings. People concerned about climate change who want more sustainable living opportunities in town. And what authority and established policy is this ADU built on? Arlington's master plan is the foundational document establishing the validity and mission for pursuing the zoning change that will allow accessory dwelling units. Under the introduction in part five, housing and residential development, the master plan states, and I quote, Arlington's master plan provides a framework for addressing key issues such as affordability, transit-oriented residential development, and aging in place. The master plan states that the American Community Survey reports Arlington's housing units are slightly larger than those in other inner suburbs and small cities. In Arlington, the median number of rooms per unit is 5.7. There is a great deal of difference in density and housing size among the different Arlington neighborhoods. The generally larger size of homes makes it easier to contemplate a successful move to encourage ADUs. So what do other municipalities do? To be successful, they minimize the restrictive requirements for ADU approval. According to a 2017 study by Alexandra Levering at Tufts University, 65 out of 101 municipalities in the greater Boston region allowed accessory dwelling units either by right or by special permit. But unfortunately, too often municipalities overlook the roadblocks their current zoning creates for a achieving the goal of more housing. Even in the midst of a housing crisis in this region, according to Amy Dane, housing expert, in her 2018 report for Pioneer Institute, she said most municipalities still have zoning laws that restrict single family homeowners from creating more affordable housing. Her report very strongly favored accessory dwelling units. Three, unfortunately, municipalities also ignore that most citizens want ADUs. Citizens want more ADUs, according to a Bankers and Tradesmen's article in March 10th, 2020, talking about the Boston region. 63% of people in the MAPC region approved of ADUs. California has recently passed strong pro-ADU legislation. And a study by Zillow further corroborated this strong interest in communities across the US, including our region. Last, why is it important to avoid additional requirements and instead respect the existing administration of building codes and life safety codes by town government professionals? State and local building codes are administered by town professional staff in the Inspectional Services Department. State and federal life safety codes are administered by town professional staff in the fire department. The wide range of housing styles, types, and ages will almost certainly require the homeowner to hire a professional contractor 
to bring their property into code compliance for adding an ADU. The professional contractor will work closely with the town professionals on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure each property is in compliance before it can be certified for occupancy. Compliance with building and life safety codes already will make this a complicated process. If Arlington wants more housing diversity for the missing middle, now is the time to move forward with the approval of the accessory dwelling units article by amending the zoning code with the proposed article 19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara Thornton. So we will uh, run through the uh, list of uh, the redevelopment board members uh, for any questions that they'd like to pose about this article. Please remember that discussion and, uh, and any further uh, voting on this article will happen on Wednesday night's meeting. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, Ken Lau. Hi. Um, yes. One quick question for you, Barbara. Besides just the change from not requiring a special permit, all the other um, um, rules you had in, in place before still apply, right? There's no uh, outside changes, no additional parking, um, such, such as we talked about before. Uh, yeah, it's it's this is a, a strange situation to be in because you and I can talk about this when we were expecting to to have a hearing on it in um, March, and it's now October. Yes. So, are you referring to that conversation? Yes. And and it and it has changed a little bit, and it's changed to, to make it as of right across the board in all of the districts. That I understand, but. As far as dimensional requirements, setbacks, um, um, not, bump outs, not, nothing. Not, no, no change. Okay. Um, I'm all set for now, Rachel. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Jean Benson. Uh, thank you. Um, Barbara, thank you for. Um, filing the warrant article and for your very informative and helpful presentation this evening. As you know, and as I think most people know, the um, Redevelopment Board um, submitted a different ADU warrant article. They got more than 60% of the vote in favor at last town meeting, but failed to pass because it needed 66% in favor to pass, so it failed by a few votes. I have a few questions about some of the concepts in the warrant article that I don't quite understand. Um, in the zoning bylaw, a distinction is made between two-family dwelling and duplex dwelling. Uh, two-family dwelling is defined as two units that have at least part of them on top of each other, and a duplex is basically a two-family dwelling that are side by side with none on top. What you have here is to allow accessory dwellings in single family and two family dwellings. Did you intend to also include duplex dwellings in that? Because duplex are technically under the bylaw a different definition than two family. I, I would want the broadest interpretation possible and my default is to is to go take the building inspector and the fire inspector and stand in front of the building and say can we make it legal uh to conform to life safety and building codes in this it, it, building all right so in other words it sounds like this would say in single family dwellings two-family dwellings and duplex dwellings was your intention and not to omit yes. duplex dwellings yes. um, from this. Okay. Um, it wasn't clear to me about that. Um, in, in some of the, um, uh, Jenny, can you go to the previous page? Thank you. Um, why did you um, include four or more rooms 
um, what would be the problem with three rooms as the accessory dwelling? Jean, I have, I would prefer three rooms. I think I was trying to be, I'm not sure, uh, just be a little bit more conservative, but I have lived in many, happily in three room apartments and see no reason why. In fact, I don't even know that we need to count the number of rooms as long as it has a, a bathroom and a kitchen facility and a sleeping facility. Okay, that's help. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Um, can you, Jenny, can you go to the next page again? Thank you. Um, I think, I think there, there was some um, wording in the initial explanation that you sent us in some places that seemed to limit this to one family dwellings. I'm assuming that was not your intention. That's at, correct. At that point to limit it to that. And um, the, the other question I have is, is your intention that it would be in the existing building or could they put it in another building on the property, um, assuming that the property would allow the construction of another building as the accessory dwelling unit? Because there are some places where accessory dwelling units are actually separate freestanding buildings. So I'm wondering what your intention is. Uh, my intention is to make it, is, is to default to the most flexible based on the circumstances. And so, yes, I would, I would like to see it uh, I, I can conceive of, I, I'm envisioning a place in, in, uh, in Arlington Heights that has a house and a, a very large uh, backyard and a, and a big uh, garage that could be an accessory dwelling unit. Yeah, and I've, I've seen at least one um, huge garage get built in my neighborhood that I haven't been inside, but it certainly has the appearance from the outside of having an apartment um, on the second floor of the garage. So your intention would be to allow that also? Yes. Okay. Please. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, David Watson. Thank you, Barbara, for uh, bringing this forward for discussion and for your presentation. Um, I have at least a couple of questions. Uh, the, the first is I, I shared Jean's confusion about why the number of rooms was relevant to the discussion. Uh, and I, 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 I share it too. Okay, so I, I, I don't think we need to discuss that further. Um, so uh, just following up on Jean's question about whether an ADU could be a, a separate structure, um, the proposal uh, that went to town meeting last year limited ADUs uh, to the existing building envelope. And uh, as, I, as I take it and I, as I think you've described your intention is to uh, allow them in the existing building envelope as an addition to the existing building or as a separate structure on, on the property. That's right. So is, is one scenario you would envision, uh, um, would, that, would that be the conversion of an existing detached garage into an ADU? Could be, yes. I think the Even, only, oh, go ahead. So is there anything, is there, I'm, I'm just trying to navigate how this would interact with our existing, uh, with our with our other zoning rules and the dimensional requirements, because uh, it's often the case uh, that the detached garages in Arlington are uh, within the required setbacks. So if, if, if that garage, were converted to 
uh, a residential use, then you'd have a residential use in, uh, that's in, in the setback uh, of the property and potentially very close to abutting properties. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that would prevent that from happening? Uh, do you see that as, as desirable, undesirable? If more more housing is my goal, and I and if it's within that setback, I it doesn't for me. It's it is desirable, yes. But again, I I I think one. It's important to keep in mind that every circumstance, every request is going to be unique. And I think when the, I think that the decision point for the people who initiate this is going to be the homeowner. And the homeowner is going to say, yes, I'm going forward or no, I'm not, when he sits down with the inspectors and then he perhaps goes the next step and hires a contractor and the contractor says, you know, it's gonna cost you this much money to go forward. So I think it's the cost and I want to limit the cost as much as possible and make it as feasible as possible to, to bring these opportunities forward. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you that the approach you're taking is is much simpler than the one that was proposed last year. Um, I'm 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 working through um, how I feel about uh, not having the the process that was laid out in the previous proposal, which was largely responsive to concerns that had been raised. Uh, by the residential study group and by members of of the public, as we were um, as we were vetting that that proposal uh, during the hearing process, and um, I'm I'm just thinking about whether uh, whether those concerns um, uh, would. Um, potentially uh, arise again with this proposal, for instance, without any specific restrictions that would prevent somebody from um, not, uh, uh, from essentially converting a house to a two family and not actually using part of it as their primary residence because that, that requirement's not in here anymore uh, or uh, the issue with people being concerned about um, short-term rentals like Airbnb. And is, is there a need to address issues like that in, a, in an ADU proposal? I don't, I don't believe so. I, I spoke extensively because we were last, last time in, in the uh, last uh, town meeting, there was a lot of accusation uh, that about Airbnbs and that the sole reason for ADUs were be going to be people flooding the office of Michael Byrne demanding that there be, uh, that they get permission to build an accessory dwelling unit so they could rent it out for Airbnbs and I no longer think that's valid. And I've had, and I've come to that conclusion after extensive discussions with Doug Heim. I guess my last question is, um, since the prior proposal did actually get a significant amount of support. And I, I think with um, uh, more education of the public and, and town meeting members and more time to think about it, uh, uh, I think uh, has uh, the potential to, to pass if it were offered again in the future. Um, why, why not take that intermediate step and see how it works? Uh, well, that, with with a process and then potentially open it up more broadly after we have some experience with it. I, I would prefer to open it broadly and then narrow it if we need to. What yeah. happened in Lexington was that they created an accessory dwelling unit uh, bylaw and and then they had to revisit it because they realized that the restrictions that they had put on it were too tight. And so they, in uh, I believe it was 2016, they went back and they redid the bill to loosen it. So the, the goal has always been, as I look at all of the um, articles across the state, uh, it's been too much 
too, too tight restrictions too soon. I mean, too soon in the process. And that's why the average for, for such a long time has been, I think, 2.7, uh, an average of 2.7 uh, ADUs per year per municipality. Now that adds up if you get them decades or centuries, but it's not what we want. And so I would prefer that we open the door, make it easy, super easy for homeowners to understand and let them know you just, you know, get a contractor, see if it's doable, doable, meet the codes and go forward. And then if we find out that there are problems, like many other things, we go back and we adjust for what the problems are when we know what the problems are, not guessing at them now. Uh, Jenny, maybe you can remind me, last year uh, when we were talking about the ADU proposal, there was, I, I think, uh, an estimate that there would be only a handful created in Arlington on an annual basis. And was that estimate dependent on the, the process and restrictions that, that we were proposing or, or was that in, independent of the, the details of the proposal? It was, it was related to the restrictions that we were placing on how they would be created. And it was also based upon research that had been conducted, which was referenced by Barbara in her report out as well. Uh, which is the, the research by Amy Dane from the Pioneer Institute. So it was a combination of those two which was how we drew that conclusion. So how, how many are we expecting um, might be built annually in, in Arlington under this proposal? Are you Is asking me? me or Barbara? Well, who, whoever I, might know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I, I, um, I waited too long to try and reach out, given the COVID circumstances, uh, to Lexington. But I think Lexington would be a valid place to do that questioning because they've now opened it more, and they've—I think—they now have is it 66 or 75 uh, ADUs in in Lexington. That's not per year, but it's certainly a big increase for what they were originally hitting, which was like that uh, three a year number. So I, I think to be able to, if I've, I've got a call into them, I haven't heard back, uh, but that would be the best, the most valid source right now, I think. Uh, those are my questions for the moment. Thank you. Rachel, can I uh, speak up and try to answer uh, maybe Dave and Jean's question earlier? Sure, go ahead, Ken. Um, I believe if the structures are independent of each other, uh, not connected, each structure would have its own setbacks. So if a if a garage was standing by itself, it, it, it cannot be in the setback. It has to have, it has to be without outside the setback if it's, I believe, if it's not connected. Uh, well, except in, in East Arlington, for instance, where I am, uh, there are a lot of, of very old uh, detached garages that are right up against the property line. No, yes, I agree with David, and, and I don't dis—I don't disagree with that. I think that's existing. I, I think new. That's what I was talking about, David. I I agree with you for new. I I was thinking more about converting existing structures. That are, okay? That's there already. I'm yeah. just thinking if it was new, it, we're not creating anything new. That's what I'm trying to say. Gene? Yeah, just, I, I just want to say that if, if we, when we have our discussion, decide to make a positive recommendation along the lines that Barbara has suggested, I think that four things that we will need to think about and figure out whether and if so how to incorporate them into the recommended vote is something about short-term rentals, uh, something about whether the owner needs to live on the property, uh, something about setbacks, 
and something about open space requirements because it may be different whether you're building on top of a garage or a new structure, but I think that if we want to present something to town meeting, I think those are four things that we should probably need to think about and decide whether and if so how to incorporate them into this. Thank you, Jean. Um, I'd also like to give um, Katie Levine Einstein an opportunity to ask any questions before we circle back to any of the other board members too. Thank you. Um, so thank you to Barbara and also to Jenny Rate um, for really informative presentations that you know, outline this article in great detail and also tell us sort of contextually why it's really important. Um, so my question for you and Barbara, I know this is something you've thought a bit about, um, is our town capacity to manage um, these applications? You know, you already, I think I've raised the point that we're not exactly gonna have the market get flooded with ADU applications, you know, huge numbers per year if Lexington is any example to go by. But to, yeah, I know this was an issue when the ADU article came up last time. To what extent do you think um, the town is sort of prepared to handle this? Have you talked with officials about this? Sort of how, how, can, that, how can those capacity issues be addressed? Um, Katie, uh, me or, or Jenny? I was going to ask you, Barbara, because I know you've thought about this. Oh, I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm sure Jenny can address this too. Yeah. But, no, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I have spoken extensively to, to Mike, well, extensively um, in person for over an hour in at least once and then on the phone and exchanging phone messages, et cetera. Um, and and with the fire chief, and both of them uh, say they are they are uh, they are not concerned about capacity, their capacity to respond to this. That's their job. Both of them were terrific. They said that's that's our job. That's what we do. That's why we're here. I think that if we start getting like uh, fifty a year, you know, we may want to revisit a budget line for for additional staff, but I don't foresee that, neither do they. This is a very similar to the kind of uh, building inspection advice that he does now throughout the town. And just to clarify, because I think my connection may have cut out for a minute and in case it's happened anyone else, you talked to the building inspector and the fire chief about this and that was both, both yeah. of their perspectives. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Any other Questions from members of the board before we turn this over to the public comment. I had one other question, Rachel. Uh, sure, Jenny, you. could you scroll down to the next page? I just saw that go by. Barbara, in uh, section 5.4.2, where it says uh, not exceed 50% of the floor area of the principal dwelling, mm -hmm. uh, just to clarify, does that mean that after the ADU is added that it could be 50% of the floor area of the entire no. structure or, or that it no. would be what, no more than a third? What that means is, it, is it's a third. Okay. And, and to, to refer back to your, to your earlier question, David, regarding a, a garage, for example, uh, 50, the garage, if the garage were within that 50% of the existing dwelling unit, it would comply according to this rule. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Any other questions from the board before I uh, turn this over for public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will open this up for public comment. I remind people to please use the raise hand function in the participants uh, section of Zoom, and if you are uh, not able to do so, please unmute yourself um, by pressing star six on your phone uh, as I call you, and I will call you in the order um, in which the hands were raised. Please uh, state your name and your address, and as a reminder, you will have three minutes for any comment. So the first speaker will be uh, John Warden. Where's the, uh, 
right, you're you're unmuted, Mr. Warden. We can hear you. I, am I, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. All right, thank you. Um, uh, but uh, but I'm still. Uh, I'm... Hello. Now we can hear you again. Okay. All right, and uh, my first question is, I'm still invisible, is that, that your intention? Hello? Yes, you would, need to turn, yeah, you would need to turn your video on. Hmm? Um, yeah. you, would, you would need to turn your video on if you would like to be visible. All right. No, there I am, all right. Well, not that it's been a great improvement to the screen, but... Um, yeah, uh, 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 right, that's my first. I, 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 uh, I wish, um, uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, if if you could um, uh, allow Winnell Evans uh, to speak and and then come back to me. Uh, she has uh, filed. I think we we hope you all got copies of it. Uh, a an, a substitute motion, uh, which she she will explain, and. Um, and if you would give us that courtesy, uh, it would be appreciated. And I hope she will be given as much time as Mrs. Thornton was to, um, to, to explain uh, uh, the, the, the proposed substitute motion, which actually deals with a lot of the issues that the board members have discussed. I'd be happy to give you an opportunity to speak again. Um, if you'd like to uh, use the raise hand function, um, I do see Wynell Evans in my list coming up shortly. So if you'd like to, uh, Mr. Warden, um, hit the raise hand button again, you'll be back in the queue following Wynell Adams, or Evans, excuse me. All right, so I can figure out how to do that. Okay, I will write you down, so I will definitely come back to you if, if you're not able to do so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the next speaker will be Patrick Hanlon. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Patrick Hanlon. Uh, I live at 20 Park Street. And I'm a town meeting member from the fifth precinct. Um, I was on the residential study group uh, as a representative of the Zoning Board of Appeals and was involved last year uh, at town meeting in favor of the ADU uh, proposal that was being made then. And I was somewhat spooked at the RSG meeting uh, by uh, the statement of uh, Mr. Byrne that he would not be able to enforce it. Um, and so I was opposed to it then. Now I think Barbara has taken this beyond that. I think it's really important to decide whether or not you believe, as Barbara does, that ADUs are an important part, or an important strategy or tactic in trying to address our housing problems generally, or whether we think of them as a kind of escape valve for people who have some special need that need to be cabined in with as many restrictions as possible uh, so that they are rarely used and then only in the most compelling circumstances. And it seems to me the policy that we've taken already in the housing production plan and elsewhere is the former, that these should be as part of the strategy for affordable housing. When you think of it that way, first of all, it, I only can congratulate Barbara for not making this a special permit. I could see how adding in a different building, it might, might be a different situation. But generally speaking, by putting everything into special permits and, and proliferating the bureaucracy that is built around all of this, the effect of that is to do what has happened in almost all of the jurisdictions around us, is that we have it on paper, but we don't have accelerate, uh, we don't have these units in practice. And it seems to me that, that we really ought to be working that the other way around. I also think it's important not to limit this to R0 and R1 districts. Uh, there are plenty of single family houses in our two districts and, and some in other districts as well. And if this meets all of the other kind of zoning requirements, I don't see why it should be limited to any particular uh, zoning district. And third is, I, Winnell will talk a little bit to her substitute, which is based a lot on what we had last year. But in reading over it, I shuddered because it reminded me of all of the complexity and frankly, the impossibility of enforcement 
that largely was focused on all of that extra stuff about principal, making sure that the pr person didn't sell the house and, and so on and so forth. And it seems to me that, that if this is all going to work from a zoning point of view, that I care a lot less about the ownership point of view. And the zoning point of view has to do with land use. It has to do with physically what's where, and it doesn't have to do with controlling this or that kind of owner or this or that kind of resident. So for all those reasons, I think, I think that this is a stronger, a stronger uh, proposal than the proposal we had last year. It's a simpler proposal. It's a proposal that I think is more likely to get more support rather than less than was last year. And I'd encourage you to try to at least stay within the spirit of this proposal and not slip off into the opposite one. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker uh, will be uh, Patricia Warden. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, can you see me? I think I'm, I did show my video, but it doesn't. Can yes, you we, yes, yes, we can I, see you. Yep, we can see you and hear you. I, my video isn't starting properly. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Patricia Gordon, 27 Jason Street. Article 19 is a disgrace and I strongly oppose it. There is so much that needs to be said about this article that it is impossible to do so in the available time. I strongly oppose the article. It has zero affordability requirements, which ignores the needs of people of low and moderate income of all races, color, and age. As you know, at this time, without any article promoting ADUs, homeowners can legally do everything, all the changes necessary to construct an ADU, except that they cannot install a built-in stove. They can construct an extra bathroom, additional entrance, washer, dryer, refrigerator, microwave, George Cleman Grill, whatever, and many of, of us have already done so um, to accommodate needy family members or caretakers in this fashion. The incorporation of accessory dwelling units into the zoning bylaw is just going to promote a bonanza for developers. That the planning director is promoting it when it is totally lacking in affordability requirements, zero affordability, that is unconscionable. The planning director is, and the planning department is opposing the needs and desires of residents of Arlington in this article. The development officials should instead be appealing to brokers to make listings of older homes being sold available to the public and to the town of Arlington rather than to developers to fuel the teardown industry. It, they um, are ignoring, the planning department is ignoring the urgent needs for affordability emphasized in Arlington master plan. The proposed article is simply a vehicle for enabling teardowns and so eliminating affordable homes and replacing them with a greater number of much more expensive homes and luxury units. It, as is, is also the case in Article 18, they are enabling increased school expenses and much higher residential taxes. The planning department should be ashamed of itself. Ms. Warden, you're at time. Thank you very much. So the next speaker uh, is Wynell Evans. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I'm also speaking tonight as a former member of the residential study group. We had one discussion about ADUs, but unfortunately the group was disbanded before we could really get into it. However, I did my own research based on the 2018 Amy Dane authored paper for the Pioneer Institute, which Barbara mentioned, and found that communities nearby to Arlington that allow ADUs do in fact have a significant number of requirements. They are mainly by special permit. They are on lots at minimum sizes significantly larger than Arlington's. They are required to be within the existing footprint. Uh, they prohibit lodgers. They have the requirement that one unit must be owner occupied. The ARB's 2019 version, which was so narrowly defeated, contained these requirements. But the current Article 19 that is before you, while I, I believe it's very well intentioned, it lacks these protections. And it purports to enable the creation of additional affordable housing in town, but it offers no mechanisms by which to do this. So the substitute motion, which I have submitted, is based largely upon the 2019 version with the additional clarification and safeguard, uh, which by the way, address many of the concerns uh, that people had then and concerns raised by board members tonight. It is also in line with ADU bylaws in other communities, and I believe that it comes much closer to being a consensus version that can be supported by most Arlington residents. My own personal feelings are that if ADUs are used to house family members or to provide small affordable units, then I see great benefits. Uh, and most of the people who spoke in 2019 at town meeting were also talking about housing family members. And as people have pointed out, in communities where they're allowed, there's not suddenly a huge explosion. There are not, you know, thousands of units created. But this is partly because they are not inexpensive to build. Most of them will cost over $100,000 per the estimate of members of our inspectional services. So this makes it quite likely that a homeowner who goes to that expense is going to want to rent their ADU for the highest rent they can get, or they're going to want to put it on the short term rental market, which I hope even the articles proponents understand could be less than desirable for neighbors. So let's let's craft an article that makes them serve their purported intent by requiring affordable rents by prohibiting short term rentals and by requiring owner residents in the main unit, among other safeguards contained in our substitute motion. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. The next speaker uh, will be Steve Revelack. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Steve Revelack, and I live at 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Uh, I'd like to voice general support for this article, um, you know, and to take a bit of a trip back in history, uh, namely to 1988. So back in the late 80s, um, housing costs in Arlington were also rather high. Uh, the town had a fair housing committee at the time, and they commissioned a report on with some um, you know, to provide some suggestions on how to address, you know, what were, you know, high housing costs, costs then. Um, mainly, you know, and high interest, well, they couldn't address the high interest rates. And fortunately, we don't have that problem anymore. But two of the recommendations that came out of that report were accessory dwelling units, um, you know, which we're hearing about tonight. And another was uh, real estate transfer fees, which unfortunately did not make it onto this uh, town meetings warrant. Uh, so I'm happy to see that we continue to try to find um, find a way to allow ADUs, and that we're still, you know, that we're still looking at them and still considering them. If two, gr if different groups of people at completely different times come to the same conclusion, there's probably some some merit to it. Um, I appreciate the straightforwardness of Ms. Thornton's article. Um, to me, it seems like it's designed to actually you know, promote the construction of accessory apartments rather than to impose a, a lot of restrictions so that, yeah, you got a law on the, on the books, but it will rarely be used. Um, and finally, I would like to uh, concur with some of the board members in that 
you know, in um, allowing ADUs of less than four rooms. I lived in a three-room studio for quite a while, and I thought it was a rather nice arrangement. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker on the list. The next speaker on the list is Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Last year, the head of inspectional services spoke in some detail about the difficulties of enforcing an ADU bylaw. In a candid moment, he declared that his department could not enforce it and would not enforce it. That is an exact quote. The department cannot even control illegal ADUs today. For instance, some years ago, the owners of a very large house in my immediate neighborhood went to the Board of Appeals for a variance to build a two-story garage on the rear property line. They said the second floor was meant to be just a simple artist studio, two rooms and a cleanup sink. The board was pretty skeptical at the time, but granted a variance with the strict provision that it be just a studio with no living spaces. But once they had the variance, the owners tossed the original plans and went to inspectional services with a new set of plans. Two bedrooms, a full tiled bathroom, a living room, and a fully equipped eating kitchen. No one at inspectional services noticed or even cared, either at the time of submittal or during the various on-site inspections during construction, that an illegal cottage was being built in a backyard right on the property line overlooking the neighboring property. It only came to public attention when the property was sold and the realtor, realtor advertised it as having a separate in-law Airbnb unit. The building inspector was reluctant to get involved and said that there was really very little he could do other than require them to disconnect the built-in stove. It's a near certainty that this bylaw as framed will be abused and exploited to build units that are far from what its intent is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Steve Moore. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve Moore, 64 Piedmont Street. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna speak right now as a citizen first. Um, Ms. Evans stole most of my thunder. I, I uh, was going to speak to her concerns and I think her substitute motion probably uh, would make sense to me. Um, I think there's a, some significant reasons why towns move quite slowly here. Not just uh, the, the not in my backyard syndrome, but also uh, concerns about potential abuses. Um, and the previous, uh, the speaker that just preceded me spoke to that. Um, so I, I'm glad that, that we're thinking this through. Um, I think one of the reasons it was uh, ADUs were focused on R0 and R1 was because those lots are sizable enough to perhaps deal with the, uh, the, the separate unit or an expansion of a, an existing dwelling to, to house such an item. And if we expand that to R2, so many of the R2 lots are so much smaller um, that I'm not sure that those lots would, would accept as well any additional building that was outside the envelope. Plus it would uh, definitely increase density in some neighborhoods that are already pretty dense as it, as it is. Um, and so, uh, so I do have some concerns. I, my understanding of, of 2000, uh, the 2019 discussions was that there was some significant concerns and the planning board was not, uh, the redevelopment board company was not planning to move forward until town meeting 2021. Uh, 2020 town meeting, of course, was, well, we all know what it was. Um, and this sort of precedes that in a, in a much more open way than, than was offered in 2019, which had ex uh, restrictions which um, I think, as Ms. Evans said, uh, addressed a lot of the concerns that this particular article being proposed does not. Um, it, it opens a potential floodgate much wider. Uh, secondly, uh, now as a member of the Arlington Tree Committee, which I'm a member of, 
I know sustainability was quoted. Um, uh, additional buildings in town, an additional building of open space almost necessarily means taking trees down. And trees are a resource which the town uh, it generally supports. And we're trying to make sure we re reforest our, or, you know, restore the canopy in town. And I'm not sure this is in line at all with that. I think that needs to be considered as well for building outside the envelope uh, of existing of existing structures, because um, that truly would help some sustainability. Uh, anyhow, thank you much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker on the list is Alex Bagnall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Alex Bagnall, Wyoming Street. I support the ADO article as proposed by Barbara Thornton. We need to do everything we can to increase housing options in town. Many of the same issues of systemic inequality and exclusion with single family zoning are present in this question also. Our goal should be to encourage the creation of ADUs, not to make them theoretically possible, but next to impossible in reality. More housing units will help with the constant upward pressure on housing prices due to demand far outstripping supply. People desperately need more choices about where they can live, not a maintenance of the status quo. To encumber the ADU process with additional restrictions and the onerous special permit process will ensure that few of them ever get built. To encumber it with additional restrictions, uh, I urge the board to support the article and encourage greater housing choice in town. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Carl Wagner. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road in Arlington. Um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm, I'm pleased to speak after Mr. Bagnall because I think he's uh, incorrect in what he hopes will happen. And I'm pleased that uh, the proponent of the article is concerned about um, affordability and uh, the issues that go along with diversity. She's also mistaken in this article. Um, the original article in 2019 was rejected by a town meeting, even with many more protections, partially because of a lot of problems that would have occurred even with those protections. But to me, speaking about diversity and affordability, uh, not speaking about just making more units, which of course this will do. For affordability and diversity, let's talk about those. There's no affordability requirement of these units. The only way that the town and this ARB should accept an ADU uh, proposal is if the units that are created are more affordable than the units that already exist in the town. Furthermore, if we allow rampant two family uh, apartments in the one family zone, and as Ms. Um, Thornton wants to do, allow building apartments into the other residential zones, those are gonna go in at higher rates than market. Arlington will be less diverse. People of color and people of limited and middle incomes, including the elderly, will not be able to afford it. So I highly encourage that this be rejected right here by the ARB, unless it has an affordability clause that really makes affordable units and really makes us diverse. Uh, secondly, I'd like to point out that this is not an article that can go forward at this time because of a two-year requirement in town meeting if the planning department will say no to it. I hope the planning will, department will say no to it because it is much, much worse for the neighbors and the town uh, than the 2019 uh, proposal was. Um, I'd like to say to the planning department, you work for the people of Arlington, the residents and the businesses of Arlington. If you act to support Ms. Thornton's article in this fashion, which is worse, coming less than two years, you will be acting against the people of Arlington. We have no way to say anything to you except to ask our select board who we elect to change your mission, but we'll have to do that through voting for the select board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Zavid. Hello, thank you. I'm Zavid Pretzer. I live at 44 Grove Street in Arlington. And I just want to say that I support this article. I think it's very important to allow the creation of ADUs with uh, a minimum of barriers because uh, it's important to create additional housing and smaller and more diverse units to combat housing prices. And so I think, for example, here, 
allowing ADUs by right instead of the onerous special permit process would allow many more to be created. And while I definitely support uh, like uh, restricted affordable housing um, and efforts to create more of that, I think it's plain that there just isn't enough money for subsidize, subsidized affordable housing to address all of Arlington's housing needs. Um, so creation of additional housing that's not you know, subsidized and restricted affordable housing will nevertheless uh, bring overall housing prices down and give more options for my neighbors and relatives who are worried about whether they're going to be able to continue to afford to live here. I'll give them more chances to be able to live in Arlington and stay in the communities that they love. So I hope that we are able to increase Arlington's housing uh, with a measure like this. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, this is Patricia Wharton. John Wharton was going to speak after Winnell Evans. Yes, Ms. Wharton, he's actually next on the list. I asked him to raise his hand and, and he is uh, next in the queue. So John Wharton, uh, it's, uh, you're, you, you may go ahead and speak now. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. And uh, perhaps for, for better words, you can see me. We can see you as well. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for recognizing me finally. Um, <clears throat> the need for housing, as uh, mentioned by several of the speakers, is Uh, a little overblown. The need is for, and the only, Ar Arlington is already the second densest town in the state. It's the 12th densest out of 351 communities in the state. We are number 12 in the density. We really don't need any more people, as the Finance Committee chair, former chairman has reminded us. Um, the only thing we should be doing out of justice is to provide affordable housing. And the, the, the ADU article, which was proposed and uh, uh, discussed briefly by uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Evans, uh, does that. It is modeled on something which, as pointed out, got a lot of votes in last year's town meeting. It picks up, but it adds a very important element that the rental of the, afford, of the ADU must be affordable. And that way it deals with the issue of justice, providing more affordable housing, adding to our inventory of affordable housing. Uh, if some, the housing uh, implementation people talk, talk about the, getting to a 10% goal, you're not gonna get it by adopting the Thornton article, which is basically a, a, an invitation to developers to come into any zone, tear down the house, put up, uh, put up a mega house with, with two luxury units in it. It's going to be the, it's exactly the same thing because there, no, there are no regulations. They're already doing that throughout the two family zones. And now uh, under this proposal, they could do it in every zone. And, and that is inimical to the interests of the town of Arlington. It doesn't provide any affordability. It just makes things worse. So uh, we, we urge you to take a good look at, at the, the, what the materials we have submitted for a, a substitute motion, which uh, includes valuable protections. And, you know, it said, well, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't put too many restrictions. It'll keep people from doing things. The whole element of zoning, the, 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 the safeguards that the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, uh, Mr. Warden, you're at time. If you could wrap up, please. All right, zone, uh, zone, zoning is something that protects the interest of people who have invested in this community. And it, is, it would be wrong and indeed evil to, to, to say to those people, you know, your protection is gone. You thought you bought a single family house in a single family zone, uh-uh. No, we're, we're, we're gonna fix that for you. We're gonna put somebody new in your garage. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, the next speaker, please, is uh, Philip Tedesco. 
Um, my name is Philip Tedesco. I live at 74 Park Street, and I wanted to uh, speak in support of the uh, proposal. I think it's really great and very important. Um, and I think it really speaks to important values about Arlington that uh, that we all share, which are about inclusion and creating, um, uh, allowing for more people of all types to to live here. I think when people talk about affordability, it's important that we keep in mind there's you know income restricted affordability, uh, which is one thing, but there's also just the fact that uh, people are getting really priced out of town. You know, our family can uh, could barely afford to live here. We fear that we may not be able to continue, and certainly that our kids can't, um, won't, won't be able to live here. Um, I think this is a really, really modest, really simple, really elegant uh, um, proposal uh, to allow very simply for uh, a lot more housing of, um, you know, to, to, to exist in town in a way that is really quite modest. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Joanne Preston. Okay, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Well, what happened to my video? There it is. Uh, um, I'm going to speak. I'm sorry. Uh, could you state your name and, and address for the record, please? Yes, I'm Joanne Preston, 42 Mystic Lake Drive, town meeting member, Precinct 9. Thank and you. I live in the Webb Cowett neighborhood, which is important for my next talk. But I just couldn't let this go by. Um, people have, uh, I don't know what they're doing in Economics 101 these days, but, but building more housing in Arlington is not going to make the price of housing go down. We live in a regional housing market that goes up to Southern New Hampshire, Framingham, Dracut. Um, it just, it hasn't so far and it will not in the future. So I think it's important and I feel badly for people who are hoping that prices will go down if they build all these ADUs, they will not. There isn't one economic study that shows in one town, if they make this change, that prices will go down. And I really think it's important for people to understand that. They will not be more affordable. And also, as we know, with all sorts of new building, when more people move to town, they send their children to the school system and taxes go up, making everything less affordable. So if I could just um, please email me if you want the articles on or go to the, the uh, Harvard uh, division on um, the study of housing. We're in a regional market. Just putting ADUs in front with in all of these different houses, unless there's a stipulation that the ADUs must be affordable by our current standards of affordability. And why people who claim this is going to make housing more affordable in Arlington won't agree to this stipulation should tell you right away that these units are not gonna be that affordable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Chris Loretti. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank the proponent for the map that she supplied in her supporting documentation, because what it shows is the communities around Boston and their take on access, uh, accessory dwelling units. And what you see is for the inner core cities, all of them either prohibit them outright or require a special permit before one is allowed. And I would suggest that um, if these were to go forward in Arlington, the special permit process is absolutely necessary. Um, and frankly, it's not that hard to get. I think we have a couple ZBA members, the Zoning Board of Appeals members, they can tell you the vast majority of applications are approved. And you need this simply because as a couple people have already expressed, the Inspectional Services Department is incapable of adequately enforcing the zoning bylaw. Mr. Benson noted that in his neighborhood, 
Mr. Uh, Felser did in his. I can give you an example in mine where a large garage was being built with an accessory unit on top. They claimed it was for the business. It was very likely an apartment. It did not have the proper setbacks. Which brings me to the next point about garages being converted into accessory dwelling units. It does not matter whether it's a new garage or an old garage. You can build it right up to the property line if it meets the fire code. And I think it's totally unacceptable that you have two dwelling units with no setbacks between them um, you know, being constructed or allowed under this, under this bylaw change. The other thing I want to comment on is on the process. Essentially what you're doing is allowing one family districts to become two family, two family to become three family, three family to become four family. This, this bylaw proposal as written is not restricted to one and two family dwelling units. Um, second, I think the ARB should be putting forward its own article for, um, for accessory dwelling units if it really wants to put one forward and not glomming on to a citizen's article. You mentioned in the spring you weren't going to do any significant articles this year, and now because a citizen uh, group has, has put one forward, you seem to be adopting it as your own. Uh, I think that's inappropriate, and I think you ought to be taking the leadership and, frankly, the public outreach needed before you go forward with a change like this. As of right now, I haven't even received the warrant in the mail, and I presume nobody in Arlington has. I don't even know how many people know about this hearing um, or know about the proposed change. And, and frankly, that kind of um, public engagement is something the board should be doing as the planning board before changes like this occur. So I would strongly suggest you do not support the article it's submitted by Ms. Thornton. If you submit any ADU article at all, it should be the version that Ms. Evans has put forward that has the protections in it Ray, that other communities great. have. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any other uh, members of the public wishing to speak on this article? Okay, seeing none, I will uh, ask uh, Ms. Thornton if she has uh, any additional items that she would like to uh, discuss with the board. Thank you for the opportunity. No. Great. It's a good discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to the next article, are there any additional questions for uh, Ms. Thornton from the board members? Okay. Seeing none, we will move to, oh, I'm Rachel. sorry. Gene, I sorry. missed your, okay. okay. We'll, we'll do Gene first, then you can. Well, this isn't a question, but I do want to respond to one thing that a lot of the commenters said. And that is about the folks who said these need to be income restricted for affordable units. And the ARB had that discussion last year and decided that was inappropriate for a number of reasons. And I don't, won't go through all of them, but I would allow a couple and ask people to consider them. Number one, it was something Ms. Evans brought up, which I think is correct. It's going to be pretty expensive in most cases to create um, an ADU unit up to code. And if we expect people to do that, they're going to have to be able to rent it for what they can get to try to make back the cost. So by putting an affordability requirement in, it pretty much has the effect of making it theoretical, but not really to have ADUs in most cases. Second is, this is not only about affordability. It's about an older person um, sharing his or her home with someone else. It's about bringing in another person to help meet the costs of a place. Maybe some of the units will be less than market rate, but if we require income restricted affordability, it effectively means we're going to have few if no ADUs. There are a lot of other things that people said, and I'm sure the board will discuss them when we discuss what to do about the article. But I would really ask you all to reconsider that because I think it's basically would kill ADUs. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Ken? Um, I think Jean basically uh, said what I was going to say. And 
I was going to say, we will have a chance to discuss this um, later on. I, I don't think we should all, I think we should listen out and then discuss this after uh, uh, we uh, end public comment. Great. Thank you, Ken. Okay, so we will now move on to the next article on our agenda, which is uh, the public hearing for Article 18, which is the Zoning Bylaw Amendment uh, slash Improving Residential Inclusiveness, Sustainability, and affordabil Affordability by Ending Single Family Zoning. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Jenny Rates. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to be very brief in my comments. Um, so the, the, the memo, again, that I submitted to the board has a lot more material in it. I also have um, Aaron Swarko and Kelly Linema available should the board have specific questions about uh, any of the material that was submitted in the memo as they helped to craft it. Um, I will just note that this is a proposal to amend the bylaw to expand the ability of um, property owners to create additional housing in the R0 and R1 by converting their homes to, by right to a two family and to also permit new, if compliant with dimensional and density regulations, two families um, in what are considered single family zones or lower density uh, residential zoning districts. Um, the special permit is another option for creation of six plus units in a two family dwelling. Um, or if there's contiguous options on that parcel. Um, this, I think, in part relates to broader conversations that have happened both regionally and are continuing to happen regionally, as well in other, as in other communities and nationally about uh, housing in general and equity in general. Um, there's a lot of potential for what this could mean in Arlington, as outlined in the memo. I won't go into every detail right now. Uh, but we had conducted a report which was delivered and presented to this board as well as to the select board, which was about replacement housing and in part came from conversations from the residential study group. And that report helped us to better understand uh, the capacity for turnover of housing and also what had already been replaced um, or torn down and replaced with a, diff a different type of uh, dwelling, whether it was two family or single family homes. And so that has been the basis for how we have an understanding of what could potentially occur with this particular zoning bylaw amendment. Um, I think that the petitioners have a lot more to say about uh, the reasoning behind um, this petition and it's probably best to turn it to them so that they can outline their goals. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, so we will now uh, turn this over to the uh, petitioner, uh, Benjamin Rudick. Uh, so Madam Chair, this is Steve Revelak. Um, Mr. Rudick says, sends his apologies for not being able to present this evening. Uh, he was involved in a mountain biking accident over the weekend and is recovering from a, a, um, a concussion. So oh, he has asked me to... Best. Yes, um, so he has asked if I may present in his place. Um, I hope that would be okay with the board. Please do, yes. Okay, uh, so, um, and I see the slides are up, so thank you very much, and uh, I'll just go in. So my name again is Steve Ravalak, and I live at uh, 111 Sunnyside Avenue, and I worked with Mr. Rudick on uh, the proposal for Article 18. So generally, the proposal in a nutshell is to allow two-family homes by right in all of our residential districts. So currently, 79% of our residential land is exclusively zoned for single-family homes, and you cannot build any other form of housing there. So we're proposing to allow two families be built by right in these areas. However, we are not proposing any changes to heights, to setbacks, to open space, to any dimensional regulations. So to just be very clear, we're not proposing an elimination of single family homes, but we are proposing to eliminate the restriction that says single family homes are the only type of housing that can be built in 80, 79% of our residential land. So there are four reasons why we're bringing this back. So we want to 
you know, uh, at least acknowledge and ideally address uh, the history of housing policy as a source of discrimination. Um, I mean, there have been a lot of layers to the way that was done in the 20th century and zoning is just one of them. Uh, this will not make, you know, should Article 18 pass town meeting, the problems would not go away. It would merely be a step forward. Uh, we want to, you know, we are interested in this as a measure for uh, better sustainability, for increasing housing choices, for allowing, um, you know, less expensive new construction, and also because, you know, frankly, we do have a regional housing, housing shortage. Uh, this has already been done in a couple of different uh, places across the U.S., uh, for example, Minneapolis and the state of Oregon, and, you know, maybe we can be the first, uh, first municipality in Massachusetts to do it. So uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about the history of single family zoning. So in 1917, there was a Supreme Court case called Worley versus Buchanan, uh, and this involved racially based zoning uh, restrictions, and the Supreme Court ruled them unconstitutional. Uh, and specifically, they determined that it was against, uh, it was a violation of someone's 14th Amendment right um, if they could not sell their property to someone of their choosing. Now, single family zoning came about in part as a sort of a solution to the Worley ruling. Um, one of the proponents was uh, Herbert Hoover, who was Secretary of Commerce at the time. Um, his department did a lot to encourage the adoption of single family homes um, you know, in the 1920s. I mean, there were also other, you know, you know we talk this, we talk about here um, non-racially based or race blind means of discrimination, but there were also ones that were, you know, very out front. Uh, so for example, uh, racial covenants and deeds, which, I mean, I know of two large farm subdivisions in Arlington that had them in the 1920s. So you know, we, we were doing this just like everyone else. Now in the 1930s through the 1960s, we had redlining. Uh, we had the fair housing agencies practices of lending, which were, you know, largely based on those uh, red line maps. And this also happens to be a time where the majority of house or where a large part of Arlington housing was built. I mean, my, uh, from the late 1940s ads for my own home in my own neighborhood were, you know, advertised at 100% 20 year FHA mortgages, which me leads me to you know, believe it was intended to be a sort of a restricted area for whites only. And Arlington, you know, we, we were, at the time our maps were drawn up by the Homeowners Loan Corporation of America. There, there is no red on them. Um, they were drawn in 1947 in, uh, sorry, 1937. In 1940, uh, the census counted, I think, 35 black individuals living in Arlington out of a town of about 40,000. And that number didn't increase much in the following decades. Um, it went up to 39 individuals out of 40,000 in 1960. And by 1970, we were still a community that was 99% white. So the idea of associating single family zoning with segregationist intent was, I mean, it was, it was sort of coded back in the 20s, but people I think knew what it meant. So these are a collection of ads from uh, real estate ads from the Boston area that ran in the 1920s. Uh, they talk about, you know, a select location for single family homes in a refined and restricted community. You know, Arboretum Heights being a suitably restricted community for single family homes. And, you know, the, the, the words single family and restricted community seem to go together quite a bit. Um, then there's, we have one from Newton, a uh, hot debate under Newton zoning law, class legislation is charged at meeting. Um, this is, you know, this is, but this is, you know, the 1920s. Uh, next slide, please. So the, you know, the, these, um, you know, this sort of language has still persisted. Uh, here we have a few quotes of uh, our president. One, you know, go, talking about the affirmatively furthering fair housing regulations, you know, at the request of a great many Americans who live in the suburbs and others, he is studying the AFFH housing regulations. It's having a devastating impact on once thriving urban areas. 
And then, you know, this is from, uh, I think, June of this past summer. And then from July, we have, you know, we have the president saying that Democrats want to eliminate single family zoning, bringing who knows who into your suburbs. So your communities will be unsafe and your housing values will go down. So it's, you know, he on the, I mean, I think the intent there is, is rather clear. Uh, next slide, please. So there are, we see advantages to allowing more types of housing in, um, in our single districts that are currently limited to single family. Uh, two family zoning is better for the environment. The buildings tend to have uh, less needs in terms of heating and cooling. They are more energy efficient. And you know, by allowing more housing in areas that are already built up like Arlington, we are you know, keeping people closer to jobs and reducing trip miles. I mean, the 20th century way of building housing was you take a very large chunk of land, you lay down some roads, you lay down some utilities, and uh, build a bunch of houses and give everyone a car and they spread things out enough that everyone has to drive every place. Um, you know, this is not good from in terms of trip vehicle miles driven, in terms of adding pervious surface, in terms of clearing land and, and trees and so forth. So two family zoning will increase housing choice. You know, it is a single family homes are great for some people. They are a necessity for some people, but um, not if, you know, one size does not fit all. And one of the things that we'd like to see is to have more options available. And we also think, believe that this will improve affordability, especially with respect to new construction, uh, going right for, you know, periodically homes in Arlington, which are, you know, 50, 80, 100 years old, are torn down and replaced with, replaced with a new home. So when this happens with a single family home, it tends to be about a million and a half bucks. The high end of, you know, new duplexes is a, about a million. Yes, it is still expensive, and, but it is still not as expensive as a single family home. Further, these units do get less expensive over time. Um, my 1947 half duplex was you know, a luxury unit back in its day. Just ask, ask the builder, they, they would be very straightforward and tell you that. But you know, after having 50, 60, 70 years on it, it's, you know, it depreciates and it come, the price comes down. Next slide, please. So one of the things that, you know, when we were thinking about when uh, putting this article together was the experience last year in 2019 with Article 16. This was a, an article that would have allowed more uh, multifamily and mixed use uh, construction along our commercial corridors, Mass Ave and Broadway. And we wanted to take some of the criticism criticisms that were raised during those hearings and you know, try to address them. And some of, the, some of those criticisms were, you know, Article 16 last year would have allowed buildings that were taller and there were concern about increased building heights and shadows. So in this proposal, we are not changing any of the dimensional regulations. So height and shadows should be no more or less of a concern than they are today. So another concern was that the Article 16 would have concentrated new development to a relatively small area of town, you know, Mass Ave and Broadway. And, you know, a few people at hearings suggested that perhaps this was an equity issue. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I do, I kind of agree with that. Um, in this case, you know, we would be spreading any develop, any, the new housing throughout, um, you know, 61% or so of the town's land area. So it's not confined, it's, it's very dispersed. There were also a number of uh, concern, a number of um, displacement came up as another source of concern, you know, particularly if multifamily apartments along Mass Ave were developed. So as of now in Arlington, approximately 95% of single family homes are owner occupied, in which case they would not be converted or would not or could not be converted to two families without the owner being involved. And we think that mitigates the, you know, the concern about displacement. So we'd like to, we believe that changes are going to be gradual. So based on you know, our studies of replacement homes, we have about 27 of these a year. 
um, average over the last 10 years. If this were to so much as double um, under Article 18, that's 54 a year, which is, I mean, that's, that's a very small number in terms of uh, a town with, you know, 8,000 single family homes and, you know, 40,000 people. Next slide. So, and here's where I go quick. So this is the whirlwind photo tour of non-conforming two family homes in single family districts, which is to just show, I, what I wanna do with this is to show you that these are already woven into the fabric, fabric of several of our neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, we see them every day, even though we may not immediately realize them as non-conforming. So next slide. So this is Summer Street. Uh, these are a pair of, well, actually two pairs of two family homes along the north side. Uh, the south side tends to be a mixture of, you know, a mixture of one and two family districts, but these are all non-conforming homes on Summer Street. Next slide. So Westminster Ave, the non-conforming house is a little gray one that's sort of infill tucked behind everything else. Um, you know, again, it's a single family neighborhood and this is a two family home tucked in behind uh, a bunch of single families. Next slide. So Park Avenue, this is actually a really cool pair, pair, of, uh, pair of shots, I think. So in the one on the, in the photo on the left, you see, um, you know, there's a pair of a two family and a building with a pair of condominiums. And in the one on the right, you have, you know, a pair of condominiums and a single family home. Now on the slide, the shot on the right, notice that the two buildings are, they look really, really similar, but the main difference is that one of them has two units in it and the other end is non-conforming and the one on the, uh, and you know, the one further up the hill, the blue one, is a single family that is conforming. Next slide, please. Hillside Avenue. Uh, so we have another pair of two family homes, you know, sort of situated partway on, down the street. Next slide. Wachusett Avenue. So near the bottom, there's a whole pocket of two family and, you know, condominiums and uh, two unit buildings. Next slide. Newport Street, we've another single family area. We've got a series of three, two family homes pocketed down toward the bottom of the street. Next slide. Mount Vernon Street, this one's kind of interesting. So in the one on the left, you have a two family and another two family, the one in blue. So the, you could sort of see the part of a, a single family. And then the, the slide on the right is the next house on the street, but this is actually, I thought this was a single family, but it's actually three condominiums um, in the middle of the single family neighborhood. It's, um, you know, next slide. <laughs> so Irving Street, this is another two family uh, near the intersection of Irving and Pleasant. Next slide. Jason Street. Jason Street has some really interesting two family homes. Like here are two of them. And although one is sort of obscured by a tree, the sort of the cool thing about these is that each side has its own uh, covered porch and they're separated. The entrances are on opposite sides of the building. Next slide. More cool two family homes from Jason Street. Um, I think these, you know, the windows on the third floor kind of look like eyes to me and, you know, just sort of stuck out and it Looked like eyes and a happy space. Next slide. And finally, I think these are perhaps the most iconic pair of non-conforming uh, two-family homes in a single-family district. These are on Pleasant Street. They're in a really visible location right next to a traffic light. I've driven or ridden by them all the time, but you know they are non-conforming. So next slide. So that's I mean that's the end of the photo tour, but. Basically, one of the you know one of the things that we're we'd like to get across is that you know there is a his single family zoning grew out of a history of discrimination. Um, we have, I, I think it's something we need to at least talk about, and ideally something that we should address. And finally, you know the idea of having two family homes and you know what are currently single family districts. It's it you know we kind of already do that, and, and there are there are plenty of there are several hundred non-conforming ones. So, you know, all we would like to do is, you know, see them become legal again. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let's see, we will open this up to questions uh, from the board members. Um, remember, we will save discussion and voting for uh, Wednesday evening of this week. We'll start with uh, Ken.
Well, thank you, Steve, for uh, a very um, precise and de uh, detailed presentation there. Uh, that's much appreciative. Um, at this point in time, I'm going to hold back any questions I have until our discussion. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Jean. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Also, thank you, Steve, for the presentation and for the photos. Um, it is interesting to see, and I've seen it in my own neighborhood too, which is a R1 district, the number of um, two family homes and duplexes that are in the neighborhood, most of them um, predating zoning. So they've been um, pre existing non conforming uses and they mostly fit in, I think, uh, pretty well. And they haven't stopped people from buying and selling the single family homes next door for what I consider to sometimes be incredibly exorbitant prices. Um, that was one question that I had for you, Steve. I don't know if you have found this. Is there any research about the impact on the ending of or allowing, let's say, two family homes in single family areas in Minneapolis or in Oregon on home values? Have you seen anything? So, I mean, in terms of, no, I have not. And in the case of Minneapolis, uh, their ordinance went into place only a couple of months ago. And it does take time for, um, for these to sort of, you know, you know, for the, um, you know, for properties to be rebuilt, altered, et cetera. Uh, Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, happened even more recently than Minneapolis. So it's still, it is still early. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I'm just going to add very slightly to Steve's um, history of zoning. So after Worley v. Buchanan, where the Supreme Court said you couldn't have racial zoning, it had to decide a few years later in what's called the Euclid case, whether it would allow zoning at all. And it, it did. And it said, well, because you have to separate industrial uses from houses so people don't live next to factories, but they also had to contend with the fact that what Euclid, Ohio did is what Arlington and lots of other places do. They separated single family areas from multifamily areas. And the argument was, well, it makes sense to separate where you live from smokestacks, but what, why is it okay to separate single family homes from others? And the Supreme Court said, it's okay to do that because people living in apartment buildings are parasites. That's an exact quote from the case and that they will destroy single family neighborhoods. And of course, we now know that that's not true, but the legacy of that decision in Euclid lives on in single family zoning. Um, I had, Steve, I have a few suggested changes that I'd like to just make sure you're okay with in your proposed warrant article. Um, so in, um, in the bottom of the page that's on the screen where it says R1, I think it should say, um, let me see, where is it? Um, can, I, can I ask you to um, hold any suggested changes until after we allow for the, for the public okay. comment? It, sure. It, okay, thank you. That, yeah, that's fine. In that case, please, please um, continue, but I'd, I'd love to get public comment in before we. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll just save those for afterward then. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see, uh, David. Well, Thanks, Steve, and uh, to Ben as well for um, for bringing this forward and for an informative presentation. And uh, please do convey our best wishes to Ben for his recovery. I've had mountain bike crashes myself. Thank you. Um, so I I do have a, a couple of questions right? or thoughts anyway. First of all, I I do really appreciate um, those four key reasons that you brought up and the intention behind um, this proposal, uh, because I, I think there, there are some systemic inequities um, that we do need to address in, in some way. 
Um, and if I'm if I'm reading um, the uh, data that the planning department pulled together correctly, it, it appears that we already have about a thousand uh, structures in the single family zones that are not single family, which is about 15% of, of the existing structures. So uh, I think we're to some extent are already living with, with the condition that, that you're proposing here of, of having um, uh, more flexibility in the single family zones. Um, I, I think my, my, my real question uh, is, is one that my, my colleagues have, uh, or Jean has, has already alluded to, which is, um, this is, a, this approach is, uh, very new, uh, and in, in Minneapolis, Seattle, and Oregon, it's all been adopted and, and come into effect only very recently. And we, we really don't have any data on uh, what effect uh, it actually has on uh, either development generally or more specifically on, on affordability in the single family zones uh, or in the community as a whole after this is implemented in the single family homes uh, zones. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd be, I'd be very interested to know if there's any more information to be found on that. Um, you know, whether it's from those three places that have adopted this, or if there's some kind of analogy that can be drawn from someplace else that's had a longer experience with this. Um, but that, that's really my only question on this. So I think the best example of, um, of this kind of thing, and it is not directly comparable, uh, but it would come from Seattle. And the information I'm uh, drawing from is from a book called Randy, uh, it's a book called Generation Priced Out by an author named Randy Shaw, who spends several chapters uh, detailing the uh, ways that Seattle and San Francisco responded to housing pressure. So in San Francisco, it was the tech boom. In Seattle, it was Amazon. So, you know, Amazon's headquarters in Seattle is huge. And, you know, for a while, the city just could not build housing fast enough. But they tried. They really tried. And after several years of doing that, you know, in Seattle versus San Francisco, not doing anything or building very little housing, the both were high priced areas. But uh, Seattle was, you know, considerably less, was less expensive than, um, than, um, than San Francisco. The other point of inform, the other point I would like to note is that, you know, as uh, I think it was Joanne Preston's saying earlier that this is a regional problem and we will not be able to do this ourselves. Um, however, I, I think other communities, communities, towns, cities, they pay attention to what each other is doing. Um, if we were to, um, you know, go this way and other communities were to follow, I think we do have a chance at, you know, making a dent in the regional problem. Thank you, Steve. David, did you have any other questions before we turn it over to Katie? No, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Katie, do you have any questions for Steve? So I don't know if this is procedurally the right time to do this. I can actually answer some of David and Jean's research-based um, questions about sort of studies they're interested in. So I can either do that now or I can wait to the 28th, whatever is more appropriate. So you do, since those questions have been posed as questions as opposed to discussion items. Cool, and I won't dig into sort of how I interpret the, you know, the, what my views are in this particular article since I wanna hear from the public on their views before stating my own. Um, but just to answer their questions first, um, recent evidence from Minneapolis tells us there has not been a massive permitting boom of triplexes um, in you know, the places where the, they're not legal. 
So I think insofar as we can take any evidence and you know, Minneapolis, as everyone has pointed out, is still super recent. It's January 2020, um, where this really came into effect. Um, but what I think we can take from that so far is that even in a big city like Minneapolis, we don't get overwhelming immediate teardown and development pressure and massive overwhelming of permitting authorities. Um, so that's sort of what we have so far. The, um, I think, really good um, peer-reviewed evidence that speaks to some of these more broad questions about price and sort of what happens when we have increased supply and what that might do to prices in an area um, and what it might mean for displacement. I think some of the public comment has raised this really important issue of displacement and we as a board should absolutely take that seriously. When we have new construction, what it seems to do, and there's a couple economic studies that have just come out on this and I'm happy to share them with the board and with the public if people are interested. Um, what they show is that there may be tiny price increases that happen in like the surrounding block, but the overall effect of new development in study after study after study has been to reduce housing prices in places. It may not be massive reductions um, to the point that we can say that housing is affordable for everyone. No one is claiming that increasing the supply alone will achieve that goal, but it is unambiguously the case that when we increase the number of units, we do improve um, affordability by reducing the housing prices in a community. Um, and we don't seem to spur widespread displacement when we have new construction. Um, so that's sort of what the recent state-of-the-art evidence suggests. Um, but again, we don't have any precise, precisely identified studies of what goes on with single family zoning um, because it's just happened. What we do know unambiguously is that single family zoning has produced racial segregation. That has been replicated in study after study. So that's that's sort of where we are in the state of the art um, in zoning research. And I'm happy to talk more about that on the 28th too. I don't wanna dominate. Um, but thank you, Steve, for your um, very detailed presentation. Um, I don't have questions this time about the article and I look forward to talking about it more on the 28th. Great, thank you, Katie. Any other questions from the board before we uh, turn it over to uh, public comments? And Jean, I, I will come back after after the public speaks so that you can speak to your, your proposed um, changes as well as any other comments from the board. Well, I can send them separately to Jenny so we all have them for the 28th. Okay, great. Thank Give some you. time. Thank you. Okay, seeing none, I will ask anyone who wishes to speak on uh, article, the proposed Article 18 to please use the raised hand function um, in the uh, participant section of Zoom. I will call on you as in the order that hands have been raised. We already have a large number of speakers who have requested to speak on this. So please remember that you will be allotted three minutes for any comments. Please state your name and your address before you begin speaking. So the first uh, person to speak on this will be John Warden. Yeah, can you hear me now? I can hear you and we can see you too. Oh, good, all right. Now first I have, I have a question. I I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Warden, could you just state your name and address again for the record? Uh, it's uh, John Worden, 27 Jason Street. I live across you. some of those uh, houses, two family houses that were built before we had any zoning, built on very spacious lots, I might add, not 6,000 footers. Uh, but I have a question uh, for the board and the planning department, uh, which is uh, really central to this whole argument, this whole discussion. And it says, I'm quoting, uh, when? The petition for change in the zoning map is filed. The petition shall show that the petitioner has given copies of the proposed change by certified or registered mail to all abutters of all land affected by the petition. Uh, and I ask if that provision, that's section, uh, uh, article. Uh, Article 2, Section uh, 5 of the Zoning Recently Recodified Zoning Bylaw. I'm, I'm sorry, maybe it's Article, it's article 1, I guess. It's article 1, Section 5. Um, so I ask if that information was provided when this article was filed. And I'll turn that over to you for the procedural question. 
This is mm -hmm. posed as a zoning bylaw amendment. So there was not a zoning map amendment request. And so therefore it was not mailed to abutters um, in any of these districts. All right. The, if there ever was a, a map change, when you change the single family district into the two family district, if that isn't a map change, I don't know what is. And I think if the board is going to go forward, just ignoring that provision and going through saying it's just a, a use change within a district, you're striking out the whole, the, the whole one family district and calling it something else. How can that not be a map change? I think you're, you're laying the town open to litigation on that, on that issue. It's clear, uh, you know, clear as, clear as glass. Um, the, um, uh, and, and so, but, and, and never, I mean, e even if it were properly before the board, uh, I mean, to, to tell not to, to tell every single family homeowner in town, uh, and not, you know, it slipped us by them at a, at a meeting like this in, in the middle of the pandemic, a, a virtual meeting, it's not even a real meeting, um, uh, and, and deprive them of, of their single family status, their neighborhood is a, an abomination. And it, it, it should not occur. The, uh, the, and, and the, the fact that there are a lot of pre-existing non-conforming two-family uh, uses, I'm familiar with a lot of these. When, when those larger, when those houses were built before zoning, they were built on large lots. Uh, the, and when, when the zoning was recodified in 1975, the, 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 the effort was not to redline, not to squeeze anybody out. It was to, to try to make consistent, to, to zone each district with the predominant use in that district. There was no evil intent. I was part of that process. No, no, no one else here was. No one else may even remember it. And, and there was no, and redlining, that is talked about, you know, this is some evil thing. Redlining was done by banks, by brokers, Stuff like that. It was not done by municipalities. It was not done by zoning, and 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 this and this idea that uh, uh, <coughs> that that and, but by right convert every single family house if you want into a two family house. Um, this is this is the is, this is ADU on steroids, and, and and I I I think this is the uh, I mean, I I've been in, in town meeting for half a century. This would have to be the worst, most stupid, inimical to the values and interests of the people of this town that I've ever seen down the road in those 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be uh, Patricia Warden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, um, can you see me? We can see you and hear you, yes. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, could you please state your name and address for the record? Just doing so. Patricia Ward, 27 Jason Street. Thank you. Uh, I strongly urge you to vote no on the proposed article. And, and actually, I should mention that three of the two family houses on Jason Street belong to friends of mine and are either abutters or removed just by one house. And they are in very large lots, which can accommodate a two-family house comfortably. Um, on the basis of my efforts for 40 years in town government and on many committees studying affordable housing and the importance of open space and trees to health of residents and sustainability of Arlington's environment, I want to say that this is the worst article I have ever seen. It is shocking and exclusionary and racist. Uh, and racist in, in that it will raise housing costs so much that it will limit the housing availability for low income, moderate and low income persons of all races and colors and ages. Um, it is shameful that the planning department is presenting and promoting this racist and irresponsible material. 
the article encourages much greater residential density and zero, zero affordable units, zero affordability for those of low and moderate income of all races. The article is a disgrace. It ignores and is totally irresponsible about Arlington's greatest housing need, which is for affordability. It facilitates teardown of affordable units and replaces them with more expensive, more numerous market rate and luxury units. It represents the ultimate it represents the ultimate hypocrisy, irresponsibility, and greed sought by all of the money developers in the real estate industry. The town of Arlington should not be retaining planning officials promoting such articles, which are so antithetical to Arlington's desires and needs. We need to protect the community. Please reject this proposed vote. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Molly Brady. Uh, excuse me, Molly Brady. Hi, thank you. Um, so my name is Maureen Brady. My nickname's Molly. I live on South Beaverly Street um, in Arlington. Uh, so I'm going to pick up where I think Ms. Revelock uh, left off. So I'm a land use and property law professor. Uh, my specialty is the history of land use regulation. Uh, my next paper actually deals with the ways that nuisance deed restrictions and the law of zoning uh, changed over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries to turn people by virtue of poverty or the circumstances in which they live into undesirable nuisances that could be kept out of neighborhoods. Uh, so this concerns a subject that is very dear to my heart. Uh, and I want to go back to redlining maps uh, of Arlington, which I know earlier speakers have, uh, to talk about how little has changed in my current neighborhood. Uh, and I want to say one other thing, which is there may not have been intent uh, to cause this, but there certainly are effects. And there's a reason that the US Constitution reaches both effects and intent in its consideration of discrimination. So the red line report uh, for my district in 1838, which you can readily find at a website called Mapping Inequality, lists me as in District B9 in Arlington Heights. Although then most of the houses were new, the population is described as overwhelmingly white and white collar. Its main drawback is described as hilliness, which I can attest having become a runner in quarantine, it remains hilly. Uh, but I can believe that nearly 100 years after this racist and classist report that marked my neighborhood as a good neighborhood and most of neighboring Cambridge as low class and unworthy of the extension of mortgage loans. This neighborhood looks much the same, both physically uh, and demographically, with the extension of constantly expanding uh, single family renovations. Pertinent to some earlier comments, I should mention I'm a recent transplant. I moved here from Charlottesville, Virginia 15 months ago, although I formerly lived, lived in Boston and Watertown, uh, so I'm a terrible driver, don't worry. I turned 34 yesterday, uh, and I'm an extremely fortunate person to be a homeowner and a professor at this age. Uh, my husband and I were shell-shocked by prices in Arlington. I want to have the opportunity to raise a family here with lots of company from other young people and young families uh, from a range of backgrounds, low income, middle, and otherwise. I fear that won't be possible with the trend in housing prices and undoing single families owning is the only way to make this a reality. Uh, let me tell you also this as a historian, the reasons that are given against allowing more housing and particularly multifamily housing are old and manipulable. They are fire danger, traffic, noise, trees, decreased school quality, increased taxes, et cetera, et cetera, even in the aftermath of the 1918 flu, disease, and the risks of congestion. This is a shell game. Uh, in addition to just saying we can't permit any housing because it's not affordable housing, the next time a proposal comes in for an affordable uh, housing unit, there will be just as much opposition to it. So I think it's a shell game. We've been doing this for 100 years, one way by banning housing and hoping something changes. Uh, it is not. So I say uh, for the hope that Arlington will not be unaffordable and exclude families and people similar to my age, please do everything you can to increase the supply of housing and prevent entrenched interests uh, from keeping uh, uh, newcomers out. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, Wynell Evans. Thank you, Wynell Evans, Orchard Place. Uh, another well-intended article, which I'm afraid is going to have the opposite effect from its stated intent of providing more relatively affordable housing in Arlington and thus making it more welcoming to black minority and other lower income residents. A few points on this article. By dispersing more housing throughout town, this article counters our master plan, metropolitan area planning council intent, and most current urban, urban planning recommendations 
for allowing density near transportation corridors and nodes. This article would actually increase the likelihood that people would drive to get to other transportation. Second, the example Stephen Ben show of non-conforming two families in single family districts are lovely, but they were all built in the early to mid 1900s and are very different from the vinyl clad side by side duplexes with garage under, which are prevalent today, generic in design, and which replaced front yards with asphalt driveways. Third, giving builders the option to replace single families with two fat families will drive up land values and the value of surrounding houses. This article contains no incentive to build affordable units. Builders are in business to make a profit and will always want to sell their housing for the highest possible price as they should. For-profit builders cannot be expected to take on the societal task of creating affordable housing. Four, we have evidence right here in Arlington about how replacing single families with two families is working. Through a few examples I'm gonna give you all completed within the last five years, many of which involved the clear cutting of lots and loss of mature trees. In the R2 districts, 18 Harvard, a single family sold for 630,000. It was replaced by two condos, which went for over a million each. Nine Crescent Hill, a $500,000 single family replaced by two condos at 759,000 each. 33 Cutter Hill, a 717,000 single family replaced by two condos at over 900,000 each. 18 Norse, a 630,000 single family replaced by two condos at over 900,000 each. In the R0 district, 27 Oldham was demolished. That sold for $875,000. It was replaced by a $1.3 million house. That lot was divided and a 1.2 million house built on the other half. The average price of condos built in 2018 is $940,000. There is also a good deal of current research, which I'd be happy to share, that indicates that yes, additional housing lowers prices, but at the upper levels only and not at the middle and lower price points. So ending single family zoning in Arlington will not bring more relatively affordable housing to us. It will not enable more black minority and lower income residents to come here. It will in fact remove what remaining relatively affordable housing we have from the market. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Zavid. Hi, I'm Zavid Pretzer at 44 Grove Street in Arlington. Um, and I am broadly uh, in favor of this. I think uh, several people have mentioned concerns around trees, um, but this article doesn't change the dimensional aspects of this. Um, if we're concerned about tree coverage, I think we should enact tree protections that also apply to single family uses. Um, today, it is possible in these zones to uh, expand a single family home in order to make it more expensive and potentially reduce trees. And if we're going to be doing construction, I think construction that makes um, more houses rather than construction that makes an existing house just more expensive is something that I'd like to encourage. I definitely agree that this measure isn't sufficient to address affordable housing and uh, measures to create subsidized affordable housing are very valuable as well. But just because this measure doesn't solve um, all of Arlington's housing process, um, problems doesn't mean that it isn't a good positive step. And I think this measure by concentrating on the R0 and R1 zones that already have uh, more expensive housing, um, it avoids displacement at our existing higher density areas, um, which uh, avoids negative impact on people who currently live in those higher density zones. So I think this could be a positive step forward for housing in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Steve Moore. Uh, yes, Steve Moore, 64 Piedmont Street. Uh, again, uh, first uh, speak as a citizen for the first part of what I have to say. Um, I uh, should know by now not to follow Ms. Evans because she uh, tends, to, tends to steal whatever thunder I have. But uh, uh, anyway, what I, what I still want to say, however, is 
Um, I think uh, Mr. Revelak needs to remember. Well, not just not just Mr. Revelak. It was a good. It was a great presentation, by the way. Um, that that uh, remind folks that correlation does not necessarily equal causality. There's a lot of a lot of that being talked about right now, and uh, single-family zoning does not necessarily relate to, directly to the uh, the discriminatory aspects that have been referred to here. Um, it now it may have had that effect. Yes, that's true. However, it doesn't it isn't necessarily true that single-family zoning cause or is is the cause of discrimination or or is necessarily discriminatory. Um, Price points is a pretty hard thing in Arlington to deal with generally, I, I understand. Um, folks moved to Arlington for lots and lots of reasons. Um, recent people who've moved here, people who've moved here 10 years, five years, 20 years ago, or have been here their whole lives, they all have got different parts and pieces of Arlington that they enjoy and prefer and, and beckon to them when they, when they came. Uh, and we need to consider all those things not just the interest necessarily of folks who want to increase housing, but also the conditions of the town, open spaces, green spaces, trees, single family, multifamily homes, all those things, we need to, uh, we need to balance that out. And zoning is one of the ways that, that right now we, we kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, enumerate it. And uh, uh, so, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can continue to try and balance those various needs and requirements of the citizens of the town. Um, uh, Arlington is built out. I don't think most folks would argue that. And if you turn all the R1 zones into uh, R2 and above zones or whatever, the town becomes even denser. And I think we lose perhaps some key aspects of what makes Arlington currently a place that people do want to move. Uh, even, even, and I know the housing is expensive, but people still very much want to move here, and we have to try and balance the needs of that against the needs of more more housing for, for folks in general. Um, I think it's important for the planning board, redevelopment board, to present an integrated plan again to the town. Not do this piecemeal, like this is what we're hearing about tonight, but, and, and I know that it did not go well in 2019, but I think we still need to take an integrated approach that tries to balance the interests that I just mentioned. The piecemeal approach, I don't think will work and will have lots of unintended consequences, and I don't think our des is destined to success. This is a problem we need to approach, but it must be an integrated fashion. I don't believe these articles tonight represent that. Um, and secondly, as a, as a member of the tree committee, um, uh, the gentleman earlier Spoke I'm about sorry, Mr. Moore, you're, you're at three minutes. Um, if, if you could wrap up, you you certainly yeah, sure. can raise your hand to speak again later, you know, after we've gone through the other speakers, if you'd like to. Uh, uh, okay, uh, well, then Mr. Tree Committee, I will speak later. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, the next speaker we will have will be uh, Barbara Thornton. Sorry, hold. On. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much. I I have. Um, Barbara, I'm sorry. Could you please state your your name? And oh, address? I'm sorry. Barbara Thornton, two two three Park Ave, Arlington. And I'm going to do one further introduction, and that is that I have been trained as a city planner and have a master's to prove it. Um, when I was trained as a city planner, I thought zoning was all about protecting noxious uses until I met people who lived in Houston where they have no zoning and they all get along fine and they can't understand what zoning is uh, such a big issue in so many other municipalities. Then I read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein and I understood the, the really horrific uh, effect that zoning has had on our population in this country and and I would like to see us remedy that however we possibly can. 
Um, we're in a pandemic now and things are moving very quickly and, and this is a time of rapid change in society in a lot of ways. I'd like to think that Arlington is, can take a look at itself and we can say, who are we and what do we care about? And that we will have the, the courage and the bravery to be leaders uh, for the future, uh, the kind of future that we would like to create, the kind of future that's fair and equitable and we would be a model for other communities to follow us and not wait and see if the other municipalities around us have moved first toward something like this. I support the Article 18 that has been written by uh, Ben Rudick and, and Steve Revelak, and I hope that we will not be bogged down in incremental change or further committee studies and that we will think of ourselves as being bold leaders and move forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Jennifer Seuss. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, with your permission, I'd like to speak to both of the articles, uh, Madam Chair. Please. Um, so I'm excited about the two articles before us today. Both would increase the amount of lowercase affordable housing in Arlington. And the nice thing about these articles is that they would create um, distributed, this type of housing is distributed throughout town. So not necessarily concentrated. And that's not to say that we can't have further proposals to build more housing in near transit centers and in concentrated. Um, these articles aren't the end of our zoning discussion. They don't do everything um, as lots of people pointed out. Um, when looking at zoning changes or really any sort of policy decision, we have to look at what our current trends are. And our current trends, so what happens if we do nothing? In our current trends, we don't have the option to freeze Arlington in, in, in place. We're losing natural affordability. If a single family um, small cape comes on the market, it doesn't remain affordable. It doesn't remain small. Um, it often gets torn down and, and a bigger house gets developed, a single family house. Or if it remains small, it, it doesn't stay affordable. I mean, if you look, look at Palo Alto, California for small, dinky <laughs> houses that are not affordable anymore. Or the neighborhood, I frankly, I grew up in in Brooklyn. My parents live in the same, or my, my stepmother does, the same dinky small house that they bought um, 40 years ago, which is not affordable anymore. Um, so, so if we do nothing under current trends, we're losing natural affordability, we're losing generational diversity, diversity, especially for people under the age of 35 and those over the age of 65 who don't have an option to stay in Arlington, and we're losing economic diversity. Adding more housing doesn't solve the problem. The, adding these proposals doesn't solve the problem by itself, but it can help mitigate the trends. We can't, Arlington can't solve this regional housing crisis by itself, um, but that's not an excuse for doing nothing. I believe we have a moral responsibility, frankly, to mitigate the affordability crisis that we find ourselves in the greater Boston area. Um, there are lots of really difficult and trans problems that are hard to solve, but including um, racial issues, but it doesn't mean that we don't do anything. We, we need to sort of step up and do something. Um, I, I'm very interested in people who talk about Arlington being a leader. We've often been a leader in problems. So again, we by ourselves are not going to solve this. Boston and Somerville have ambitious housing production plans. Other communities haven't stepped up, but by Arlington stepping up and potentially there's discussion in Brookline, by them stepping up, we can sort of start this ball rolling that can, again, not instantly make everything affordable, but just sort of mitigate the trends that we're currently going through and make things not be as bad as worse. Um, proposal for accessory dwelling units is a win-win. On the proposal to eliminate single family zoning, I have to admit that I was initially nervous about it. Um, and I want to encourage you, am I up in time? time. Yep. And I, and I, yes, we are. And I neglected to ask you to state your oh, name. Oh, my address. For the record, please. Yes, sorry. Uh, Jennifer Seuss, 45 Teal Street. Um, right. If you do okay, just again, though, I'd you know, be happy to have you raise your hand. Um, we do have a couple people who have asked to speak again. Um, sure, I'll raise my hand again. I have, yeah, I, Thank you. I serve less coherent than I thought. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. There's been a lot of speculation and conjecture tonight. 
I only have a few facts to offer. Let's start with the petitioner estimating just one student for every um, 17 new homes, I believe. Fact, in Arlington, we actually have three public school students for every 10 households. And that does not even include Minuteman Tech nor uh, special private schooling that the town pays for. We've also been told that we should be following the Minneapolis model. Uh, fact, the town of Arlington has a housing density that is 15% greater than the city of Minneapolis. We've also been told that our zoning is racist and a barrier to minorities wishing to move here. Last time that I checked, we were not a gated community. Instead, I see 1,000 open doors. Fact, we have a healthy turnover of housing units. According to the Census Bureau, nearly 1,000 renters and buyers find a new home in Arlington each year. We've actually become a magnet for recent immigrants. Fact, one in five current residents was born overseas. Now let's get to the core of the argument that ending single family zoning is gonna result in cheaper duplex housing. Fact, over a two year period, every teardown of either a single family or two family house in the R2 district resulted in a new duplex in which each unit costs more than the original house. On average, a developer bought the property for about 750K and sold the new duplex for just under 2 million. In not one instance was a new unit cheaper than the original single or two family home that was torn down. The profit margins are such that the elimination of sim single family zoning will open the floodgates to tearing down moderate cost single family homes to re be replaced with more expensive duplexes. This article is not a path to diversity and a wider range of housing, but instead a highway to ex accelerated gentrification. One final fact, in each of these R2 developments, all of the units were converted into condo ownership. Moderate rental units were eliminated and only those who can afford an average purchase price of nearly 1 billion could return. This is not creating diversity nor more affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Carl Wagner. Thank you, Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road in Arlington. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can and we can see you, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, the proponents spoke for about 10 minutes uh, in, in concerning historical terms about racism that has been a factor in our state and across the country. And in this environment, we are all very aware of that. And many of us, including myself and all the speakers here, I'm sure are working to make things better. Unfortunately, it was like a bait and switch discussion those 10 minutes. The zoning we have is not a part of the problem. It's actually a part of the solution. Believe it or not, even though we don't like paying our mortgages and rents right now in Arlington, they are actually cheaper than all the surrounding communities that touch us, except for Medford. And Arlington already has inclusive anti-racist zoning. That is, we have inclusive, inclusive rules about apartments that have to be affordable, in quotes, starting at the sixth apartment. An unusual and a model for the rest of our commonwealth is that those uh, inclusionary apartments are in the, uh, uh, the building forever. They cannot go away eventually, like some other towns. Um, additionally, we're close to transport, transit. We have bike access. Additionally, we have small lots. We have large apartments. We have two and multifamily apartments, and we have single family. In fact, multifamily is 45% of the homes in Arlington. So the proponents of this uh, article, which is an extreme article and really should go to the whole town, as Mr. Warden said, should not be up to the ARB to, to push forward or not on it. Uh, the proponents are saying that they're addressing racism. They say that they're addressing the environment. They say that they're increasing housing choice. And they say that they're allowing for more affordable homes. 
Well, all of those four uh, intentions are not going to happen. They're all false or, or incorrect. Uh, in, in Mr. Benson's question earlier, he asked if there was any research on the affordability that comes when the so-called upzoning or relaxing of zoning goes through. In fact, there is a lot. I don't know what Ms. Einstein has found, but I can tell you the predominant body of the research, which you can find on the Arlington Residence for Responsible Redevelopment page, it's called arfer.org, afford.arfer.org. All the research, or predominantly all the research, says when you do this change that the proponents want to make, rents go up, property taxes go up to deal with the services taken, people are displaced. Those people include Arlingtonians who are seniors, Arlingtonians on limited or middle incomes, and that includes people of color. However, we should not be so racist to say that all people of color want to live in large apartment buildings or multifamily units. I find that disgraceful. In fact, people deserve the diversity we have, and we have much better ideas than this to make Arlington affordable. I hope you'll look at the R for website for those and we'll discuss how to make Arlington really affordable. This will make us less diverse, more expensive, and not the place that people of color will be coming to. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be uh, Philip Tedesco. Hi, my name is Philip Tedesco. I'm at 74 Park Street, number two. Um, I, I just want to support this article for the reasons stated um, by the others. I thought it was most um, compelling, you know, to see the number of examples where we kind of have this already to kind of, while I think people have called this radical and, or whatever else, it's actually not. And it's quite fits in already kind of with what we have in town. But what I think what we want to do is have you know more housing for more families. We live in a town now where every house is a total bidding war. And that's only because it's this complete shortage of, of housing. Um, people need more options um, and more homes. Uh, we're at a point where you know high-end white collar professionals are, are totally priced out of town. Young families are totally priced out of town unless they're, you know privately wealthier, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what, because I don't know how you could possibly otherwise afford the housing prices today. Um, I think for us, we wanna set an example. We're, you know, Arlington, I think we should be proud of the values we espouse, uh, both, you know, grassroots across town and in our official statements about inclusion, about, you know, being progressive. And we should, uh, you know, be courageous and, 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 and do this on the one hand, on the other hand, recognize that what we're doing is actually not that radical um, or that crazy. Um, you know, my family and I live in a, uh, a duplex, a unit of a duplex that was uh, put here in place of a very old single family. Um, and I think there's two things to say about it. One is we're very happy that the house was created for us and our family to live in. It also provided a house for our neighbor. And while I, I'm, I suspect that our unit did cost more than um, the, uh, uh, the builder paid for the single family, um, our unit certainly costs less than it would have for the, um, just to put a single family. I think, to, um, I think another people have spoken to that, but uh, I think it's important to, to, to make sure we have the right baseline compared to. So anyway, thank you very much and um, I support this. Thank you. The next speaker on this topic will be uh, Joanne Preston. Can you hear me? No, we can, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Joanne Preston, Mystic Lake Drive, <clears throat> uh, town meeting member, Precinct 9. I live in the Webb Cowett neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> there's so much wrong with Article 19 and 18, that I'm sorry I can only cover a few points. Um, I'd like to say that um, <clears throat> much data has been talked about but I think of my neighborhood as a living history museum to why this article is such a disaster. Um, in my little neighborhood zoned R2, we've already experienced the tear down of seven single family homes to build 
market rate duplexes by right. So it's what is proposed. And, if, and we've learned firsthand the bad effects of all of these teardowns and building. Let me begin by using the latest teardown as an example. The original four bedroom home with separate garage was built in the 1930s for and with the owner with many interesting unique architectural details, um, mission style. It remains in pristine condition until a relative uh, of the original owner died and it was bought for $800,000. This has been said before, but the developer clear cut the property of all trees in a record time built two luxury, because that's what market rate is these days, townhouses, each sold for over a million dollars. And they've now been assessed for more than that. Um, so there's a decrease in affordability. No economist would claim that a proliferation of these homes all over Arlington would drive down prices since it is a regional housing market. I, I feel sad that people think that if all this goes through, suddenly all these young families will be buying houses in Arlington. It's just not true. Now, <clears throat> there is also a decrease in the neighborhood of housing types and sizes, which the planning department cites as desirable in its supporting materials page two. As each duplex townhouse was built from virtually the same plan, I got the architectural drawings where they crossed out one address and just put in another address. As one neighbor told me, I wouldn't mind if they were not all so alike and ugly. <clears throat> Nor is it true as a supporting material from the planning department sites. Communities will also see a greater range of housing costs since townhouses are cheaper to build, page two. This does not happen in the Wicowit neighborhood as the duplexes, all of them, cost significantly more than the originally well-built single family homes. <coughs> Excuse me. Thus building homes like these all over Arlington will not increase economic diversity, nor diversity in housing stock. They all look alike. The second point I'd like to- You're at three minutes. Oh. Yeah. The cutting down trees, but I have one more important point. Um, the proliferation- I'm sorry, to be consistent, if you'd like to speak again on that last point, you're more than welcome to, to raise your hand and, and I can call on you at the, um, at the okay. when, we're, when we're through the queue. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker will be Alex Bagnall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Alex Bagnall, 10 Wyman Street. I enthusiastically support Mr. Rudick's article and Mr. Revelak's expl excellent explanation. I own a single family house in a two family zone. And I, I am here to say that I find my neighbors to be delightful. Even the ones that live in the vinyl clad two families with the garages underneath. Single family zoning is a significant contributor to systemic inequality and the economic wall we have built and continue to strengthen around our high opportunity community. We cannot ignore that the origins of single family zoning do not lie solely in a preference for a specific housing type and that economic barriers are used as a proxy for racial barriers. A nationwide study in 2015 found that more density regulations directly lead to concentrations of affluence and that increased local pressure to regulate land use is linked to higher rates of income and racial segregation. Given housing's intimate connection with our education system, residential segregation is even more concerning and is a direct cause of some of the glaring educational equity gaps in our communities. Arlington is a desirable community. Adding market rate housing in neighborhoods with high demand alleviates competition for existing homes that would otherwise drive up prices. There are also environmental benefits. Without measures like this, sprawl will increase people will travel further to and from Boston and employment opportunities, increasing individual automobile dependence and resulting in greater emissions. We must acknowledge that when Arlington has overly restrictive housing policies, housing is built in further flung communities, often with great loss of trees and green space. 
While we can only control what our town does, and I wish we were doing more, allowing two units on a lot where we now only allow one is a step in the right direction and it will help relieve upward pressure on housing prices. Leaving our zoning bylaws that for 50 years have helped create the current housing affordability crisis intact would seem to guarantee that the crisis will only worsen. I'd like to close with a quote from the Cholera Law. When we become Americans, we accept not only citizenship's privileges that we did not earn, but also its responsibilities to correct wrongs that we did not commit. It was our government that segregated American neighborhoods, whether we or our ancestors bore witness to it, and it is our government that must now craft remedies. I support this article and urge the board to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on this topic will be Charles Blandy. Thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Blandy. I live at 58 Lombard Terrace, number two, which is a multifamily house. Uh, and I'd like to echo uh, Jennifer Sussis and um, Alex Bagnell's remarks. Um, I'm reminded of the, um, the Faulkner quote, it, the past isn't gone. In fact, it isn't even past. And um, Steve uh, Revelak has put an example of a racial covenant um, in Arlington on his blog, Equitable Arlington. I recommend everybody take a look at that. Um, there are no moderate cost single family homes in Arlington, all right? Anybody can look at Zillow right now and uh, 912 square feet costs $589,000. That's a lot of money. So we are living, have lived accelerated gentrification. That's already happened. So the question is what's your baseline? Uh, the multifamily homes that would be built will be less expensive than otherwise. If you do nothing, as we have done, who's moving into the neighborhood? And it is people who work for industries that print money. Um, and you know what I'm talking about. It's Kendall Square, it's 128, Harvard, MIT. It's not cops, school teachers, people who pump gas, and people who live, the people who work at Dunkin' Donuts. You know it's not. Um, and even those who are foreign born, I mean, we all know this. They work for the same highly capitalized industries that, that print money. So if we change this, we're not acting in isolation. There are other communities. We look to other communities in Newton and Brookline. We look to them and we say, well, what are they doing? And others look to us. Um, and either we're an example of stasis or an example of progress and an attempt at inclusivity. Yes, it's a regional solution. It's a statewide solution. In fact, it's even a national and international solution, but our example matters. And uh, the state itself is tantalizingly close or has been close to passing some kind of, um, of comprehensive zoning reform. So what we do is necessary, but not sufficient. There's always a good reason to do nothing. Uh, and we know what doing nothing does. Afford, unaffordability has increased and I can't imagine my kids who are now teenagers being able to afford a place in Arlington uh, after they graduate from college. Uh, hopefully after they graduate from college. So we don't get to keep what we have. We're getting remapped by inequality and there is nothing more radical than inequality. And I would add that there's nothing more radical than climate change, uh, which this um, article also addresses. So we're going to have to decide what our values and interests are. And I think that we need to pay attention to this proposal as a statement of those values. And I wanted to move here 10 years ago um, because of density. Um, and, but I, I, I miss the diversity of other places that I've lived. And um, diversifying Arlington is not going to happen without this kind of a proposal. It is uh, it is necessary, even if it's not sufficient. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker on our list is uh, Chris Loretti. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, uh, 56 Adams Street. And this is in a two family district. I don't think I've lived in a single family district for over 40 years. So I have nothing against two family or multifamily districts. 
I do think, uh, though, that it's unfortunate that the proponents of this article have decided to play the race card, because I think there's really a lot more to the problem of diversity and economic inequality than zoning. And I'm glad somebody brought up the um, example of Houston, which has no zoning, yet is a very segregated city. It has the same problems that other areas have with zoning. So that's really not any type of contraexample. And I suggest anyone who's been to Houston would realize that. I see this article more about money, and I see a lot of proponents as the same people who want to build, build, build in town because they think the town needs more tax revenue because the leadership we have in this town has clearly demonstrated that it cannot control spending. And therefore, we need to build more to get more tax revenue. And that's what this is about. That's what the increased building in Arlington is really about. I'd like you to take a look at the um, table three. In the, um, in the memo from the planning staff, because I think that um, really gives a good um, explanation of what will happen if this passes and how it will actually lead to increased prices and less diversity. If you look at Table 3, the more modest priced homes are around $700,000. I, I, the two families in East Arlington, when they are converted, each unit goes for a million dollars or more. So now you're increasing a house price from $700,000 to a million dollars if this passes in the, in, the, our, in the single family districts. I'd like to know how that promotes diversity. I'd like to ha know how that promotes economic equality. I'd like to know how that promotes uh, a greater racial mix within the town. Frankly, it doesn't. It doesn't do any of those things at all. This article is about gentrification. And if the board wants to gentrify the town, this is an excellent way of doing it. It will help getting more tax revenue in. The people who want to spend more money will be very pleased with you. But let's be honest about this. It is not going to improve the population mix in this town in the way those who are supporting the article claim that it will. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker uh, who has not already had a chance to speak this evening is uh, Brian Ristusha. I apologize if I butchered your last name. Oh, that's okay. You're close enough. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I'm Brian Restusha. I'm at number 73 Ryan Cliff Street uh, here in Arlington. Um, and uh, there's so many areas to discuss, but I've only got three minutes. So there's two things I'm going to focus on. Um, the first is with respect to um, some of the other comments that we've seen. Uh, it seems to be a recurring fallacy of comparing the sale price of new duplexes constructed in a two-family uh, zone to replace an existing single-family with the cost of older, obsolete, unrenovated homes that they replace, instead of the sale price of a renovated single family home. And the property records are clear here. Um, duplex units individually are significantly less expensive than the typical rebuilt or renovated single family that might be put there instead if the duplex wasn't allowed. Um, and generally speaking, uh, first time home buyers are not in a position to compete with builders who wanna get these rundown properties um, to renovate and so, the supply of unrenovated properties is pretty limited. And I think, um, um, you know, I, I don't buy that argument and I, I encourage the rest of you uh, to look at it very critically. Um, and finally, I, I encourage all of us to reject the recurring argument that our single family zoning is not built on a racist and segregationist foundation. Um, I've heard a lot of folks tonight say that Arlington wasn't a party to redlining because we were on the right side of the line where financing was easy to get. Um, they're leaving out who the financing was easy for, um, you know, obviously white people that are relatively well off, um, and the powerful motivation for our town at that time to adopt single family zoning in order to price out the sort of residents who might erode that state of affairs. Um, so again, I encourage uh, everyone to be critical of that sort of line of thinking. And I think that's all I have time for. Thank you very much. Let's see, is there anyone um, new who would like to speak? Otherwise, I will go to the, um, the four people who uh, had additional points to make. 
Seeing none, um, I will ask you to please stick to, to new points uh, that you would like to bring up as we uh, discussed when you were speaking previously. And we will start with Steve Moore. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve Moore, 64 Piedmont Street. Uh, I just want to say I was thrilled to hear uh, Mr. Bagnell's quote at the end of what he had to say. That's, that's something we need to live by in society. But that's an aside. Um, I'm speaking now as a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. Just to finish off my thought, um, an earlier speaker had talked about the cutting down of trees. Uh, there is the bylaw in town which talks about if you're going to do certain types of renovations or definitely for a teardown and a rebuild and a demolition, um, within the setback, uh, those trees are protected, meaning uh, there has to be a tree plan either to save them or a fee that has to be paid to the town uh, when you want to take trees that are uh, mature and large and are in the setback. If the trees are not in the setback, which uh, is true a lot of the time for these teardowns as well, they're not protected. And, uh, and so the tree loss is not, there is no compensation financially to the town and you lose the, the um, ability of that tree to uh, cleanse the atmosphere. And one of the, one of the core purposes of the reforesting of the town that we're trying to do is to be sure we maintain the canopy, reduce heat islands, uh, uh, help generate uh, a better, literally a better atmosphere uh, for the location because trees do that and that's how they contribute to uh, sustainability. Uh, it is true that if you uh, don't live in Arlington but move farther out, uh, building farther out uh, means you have to take those trees as well as the emissions produced by those vehicles. Uh, so I can't say that it's a uh, zero sum or not. I just wanted to be clear about how that how it does work in town with the uh, the protection of the trees. And there is a loss as you build out the town further beyond in the R1 zones where an awful lot of the trees are. You will lose canopy uh, as buildings are placed where the trees are. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Jennifer uh, Sussy. I'm sorry, Hi. it's Jennifer Sussy. I, I oh, want to make sure. Seuss. Jennifer Seuss, 45 Keel Street. Thank you. Um, so two, just two remaining points. Um, one, I do want to talk about the school issues as I was very recently a member of the school committee, but um, I, I also just want to say this has been a really good discussion and I encourage you to put forward this article actually to continue the discussion. I think that we need to have a larger discussion in town meeting about housing issues and in our community. I think when I hear people talk about this, I hear a lot of anxiety on all sides, right? We're, many people of very good will can have divergent views and can discuss them productively, I think. And I, I see a little bit of that going on today and I'm, I'm really heartened by that. Um, and so I just encourage you to, to, to sort of approve this for further discussion at town meeting. Um, about the schools, um, the McKibben report uh, that came about, I think it was four years ago, it's actually been pretty closely accurate to what we've seen in the school uh, population. And according to that report, we're supposed to be getting peak in elementary enrollment this year. Now with COVID, everything's all crazy, but we've already seen peak kindergarten enrollment. Uh, so if we start adding housing in the, in the kind of numbers that we're talking about, we're not going to overwhelm the school system. We're not going to, everyone's not going to come in in just first grade or just kindergarten. We're going to see a, you know, a diversity of, 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 of kids. Um, so I'm not personally worried, and I, I, I know people have expressed that in the past, about school overcrowding. I am, though, bringing back to my earlier point, sort of worried about this trend of losing generational diversity. And I know Chris Loretti is sort of lobbying this as an accusation, but the health of the, the financial um, town is important. If you just have people living in Arlington who have kids in the school system, and you don't have options for people to downsize and stay once they're over 60 and don't have kids in the school system, or to come to Arlington before they have kids in the school system, so if you've lost all that housing diversity and you've lost affordability, then it really does put a lot of economic pressures on the town. But if you have lots of different divergent housing opportunities for the entire life cycle, then you have, a, you know, you have a better community in general, but you also have an economically better community. 
And those are just the two remaining points I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Uh, thank you again, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I just have one more piece of data to add to the discussion. Uh, it addresses the question of just how many more housing units do we need to build in order to make a difference? And the Metro Mayor's Coalition, of which we're a member, has an answer. 189,000 units among its members. Arlington share is 6,800 units, a 34% increase in our current housing, a 34% increase in our population. And according to the Metro mayors, if all the communities achieve that kind of goal, then that would just temper the rise in prices. It's not even gonna lower them at that kind of level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Joanne Preston. Hi, I got interrupted, <laughs> but let me just say quickly, because people have brought up some points, um, like Jennifer Seuss brought up the McKinnon report. It was based on any, I'm an academic too. <laughs> um, it's based on projections for the future. And when it does that, it, it, th everything, all other factors stay the same. What has not st stayed the same are the big increases in taxes. Senior citizens have moved out of my neighborhood because they can't afford the taxes. They don't buy condominiums here or rental apartments because those are affected by high taxes. They move next door to Medford or Burlington. So that doesn't add racial uh, um, age diversity. But what I've, um, and people have covered the environment, and it is true that we've lost a lot of trees. Major region, reason is construction. Trees, while scientists have said in residential areas, are the major way to remove carbon. And I thought we were trying to get to zero carbon. Um, most of the trees are on residential property. Um, but this is something else I wanted to talk about. Um, much has been tossed around about affordability. I don't see how luxury, which is what these are going to be, market rate um, AUDs, or we have known from in this discussion that these duplex townhouses are more expensive than the original ones. The original ones in my neighborhood were all in perfect condition. Um, so it was not a dilapidated house replacing a new modern spiffy house. But more importantly, I don't think the proliferation of expensive, which these will be, luxury townhouses, duplexes are serving the housing needs of Arlington. I'm a member of the board of the Arlington Housing Authority. And I'd just like you to know that we have a waiting list of over 300 low-income applicants, many of them homeless. When I think about affordable housing, this is what I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about luxury duplex townhouses. And this is really the affordable housing we should be talking about here. We shouldn't be talking about million dollar um, duplex housing. Um, and I only wish we could spend our valuable time and the expertise of the people here on this pressing problem. I think this is our moral responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other members of the public wishing to speak on this article? Seeing no hands raised at this time, I will um, first of all thank the public for a um, very engaging conversation on, on both articles. I appreciate all of the voices that we heard tonight, um, and there's certainly a lot to take back into our discussion, which will occur on Wednesday evening. Um, do we have any other questions uh, from, the, from the board or um, for Steve before we allow him um, a chance to address any questions or comments that might have come up? Okay, Steve, did you have anything that you wanted to 
to add? Uh, nothing further this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jean, did you want to go ahead and identify those suggested changes or would you prefer to send those through to Jenny? Yeah, I, I, will, uh, I will send them through to Jenny and you. There are just some things that I thought needed to get added so that it at least is um, complete on what need, would need to be done if we were to do that. And one of the things I forgot to say when I first spoke is to sort of thank Jenny and the other staff for that really, I think, very, very good and very, very helpful and informative packet they put together for us to take a look at. I'm sure it took a little time to do it. I would say it was time well spent. And I meant to say that before and I forgot. So thank you, everybody. I agree. You took the words right off my page. <laughs> so thank you. I think I, I would definitely echo that too. Thank you, Jenny and Aaron and Kelly and everyone who put that together. Thank you. And you're welcome, of course. Great. Um, any other items from the, from the board? Okay. Um, I'd be looking for a motion to continue the open public hearing to the next scheduled date, which is October 28th, 2020 for the sixth uh, article that we will be hearing. So motioned. Second. Okay. We will take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Great. And we will see you all on uh, Wednesday night, the 28th. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.